testing. What do you need? Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Projector, projector, power on, and then power on. Okay, it's not powering on. Okay. Uh, uh, is yours projecting right now? Yes, that's why it looks like this. It's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up. It's warming up. No, no, no. Look at over there. It's coming up, it's coming up. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hello, hello. I just need to. I, I need to see. You see, the thing is, you see this. Why, why is the volume off? Why is the vo volume off? Did you did you did you change anything? No. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Is the volume back? Is the volume back? Is the volume back? Is the volume back? That's a problem. <laughs> Is it still on? It's good. It's good. Can I work? Okay. Uh, the other so recorder. Do you want to do three in order of placement? Yeah. So it's for this, no, no, it's the reverse. So first place records last. No, no, like team one first, team two second, team third. No, no it's, this is the reverse. So wait, right. so like if you're team three, you team third.
Hello? My name is Zi Huan. Darby Bates. Uh, Jesse Valet Vitao. <laughs> Jesse, you got that one? Great. Liam Hosniel. What is your name? You have to say your name. Evelyn McDonald. Uh, Aris Purdalakis. Daniela Angulo. Nazim, number 16, yeah. Carlos. Uh, Michael, 21.
Okay. Do you hear me inside? Do you hear me inside? It's good, it's good. Can we start? Yeah.
Yeah, but okay. Testing, testing, testing. Hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Hello? Oh, hello, hello. It's not going through there. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. 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 <sighs> Holy fuck. Hmm? <laughs> no, no, I was like... <laughs> yeah, it works. Hello? Yeah? Sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Does that work? You want to re restart it. Okay. Audio works? Maybe. Audio Hello? Works. Hello? 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 Good evening, jurors. Uh, my name is Martin, and today I'll be presenting question number six, Sacks and Bowl, for UTS Team Pi. Let's take a look at the problem statement. A bowl with a hole in space will sink when placed in water. The Saxons use this device for pr uh, timing purposes. Investigate the parameters that determine the time of flow. What we'll define as a bowl is any object that can hold water inside the middle. And by drilling or 3D printing a hole on its line of mass, we're able to generate uh, sinkage with the bowl. And by changing parameters, such as the height and radius of the bowl, the shape and mass of the bowl, the density and viscosity of our water, and the hole size and our thickness of the base, we're able to generate different times of sinking. So what I'll be doing today is I'll be giving an introduction, then I'll be talking about the phenomenon qualitatively, then I'll be giving a quantitative model with a computer simulation demonstrating why the bowl sinks, then I'll be talking about key parameter interactions and experimental verification, and I'll be concluding. Let's start with our introduction. So as seen on the images to the left, uh, water will rise from the middle in into the bowl uh, and the bowl will fill. And because of this, um, the bowl will get pushed down, like quote unquote pushed down and filled. So by having a small tank of water and placing a Saxon bowl, we're able to uh, track using a timer um, 
what the time of our different treatments will take. And just an important note is that as soon as uh, surface tension breaks, which should be right now, um, the bowl will sunk. And that is what we classify as a sunk bowl. So let's talk about our phenomenal explanation. So just to define some variables to begin, we'll define big R to be the radius of the bowl, our uh, small r to be the radius of our hole, lowercase h to be the height of the bowl, and uh, lowercase delta to be the thickness of our bowl. Now we need to define what the depth and different heights will be as we'll be analyzing from a pressure perspective. So overall, we'll see that our depth is to be the water level to the bowl outside of the bowl, and uh, s to be the water height inside the bowl. And uh, since there's a pressure difference between these two, uh, our point inside the hole, uh, that is classified by h, uppercase h, which is seen here. And once the bowl has sunk, which we will classify as uppercase d is greater than lowercase h, which is the height of the bowl. So now, even before the bowl sinks, we need to see where the bowl will, quote unquote, start. And by doing this, we can ignore the hole inside the bowl and start where the, f uh, the forces are at equilibrium. That is, the force of gravity acting downwards is equal to the force of buoyant force acting up. As seen from our equation, we are able to generate where H0 will be. And this will be our uh, pressure differential at the very beginning. Uh, just a quick note is that H0 also happens to be D0 at this point. So now we need to see if the bowl will actually sink inside the, uh, inside the water. And this is from Laplace pressure. As seen in the animation on screen, even though there is a, uh, there is a hole inside the bowl, it will not sink. And this is due to Laplace pressure. Uh, just analyzing our force perspective at, at the hole, we for the bowl to actually go up inside the bowl, the force pressure, uh, the force of pressure must be greater than the force of surface tension acting in the opposite direction. And uh, plugging in our numbers for the force of surface tension and the force of pressure, we are able to generate a initial D. This basically means that if D uh, is great enough, then the then water will start flowing in. Now we need to talk about whether uh, the material matters, and this has to do with hydrophobic or hydrophilic material. Just quali uh, qualitatively, we can see that D has to relate to cosine theta, and cosine theta, which is the contact angle of the quote-unquote bubble. For uh, simplicity in our theoretical model, the bubble will be 90 degrees, as it'll be a perfect sphere to minimize the amount of surface tension inside the bubble. Okay, so let's move on to our quantitative model. And to do this, we can start with Bernoulli's principle. Um, we can set point one to be right at the height of the bowl, and point two to be right at uh, the, where the hole will be. And from Bernoulli's principle, we tell, it tells us that our pressure plus our uh, height energy plus our kinetic energy stays a constant. And since P1 and P2 both undergo exactly one atmospheric pressure, they cancel. And moving uh, combinations to each side, we can see that D minus S, which equals H, is equal to uh, a constant multiplied by the, vol the difference in velocities. Okay, so this is our initial equation. Now we must take a look from the continuity equation to substitute for V2 and V1. Since we know that uh, the uh, velocity of inflow rate multiplied by the cross-sectional area is always a constant, as it is modeled as a t pipe, uh, we can generate the relationship between the radius and the inflow rate. And because the radius of the water level, which is uh, big R minus delta, is so much bigger than the small r, we can uh, assume that V2 is much bigger than velocity 1. And because of this, we can practically, um, velocity 1 will be negligible. Plugging this back in into Bernoulli's equations, we can see that uh, our new velocity 2 is root 2 gh, theoretically. However, experimentally determined, there is a coefficient constant of discharge which varies with temperature, and this is uh, 0 0.61. So we must add this into our initial velocity. Now we need to model what uh, the change of height inside the bowl is, which what we will call delta s. Since we know how much inflow rate the water goes up, we are able to see the relationship between the change in s uh, over how much water we can see, and the math is shown on the screen. Similarly, we can do the same thing with the height of the bowl. As we stated before, um, the bowl will always be at equilibrium, where the force of gravity is equal to the force of buoyancy. Since more water has gone inside the bowl, we can assume that more mass has gone inside the bowl. And because of this, the force of, buoyanc the force of gravity must increase, and thus the force of buoyancy also must increase. Since the cross-sectional area stays the same, the delta d has to increase to account for the change in force of buoyancy. And plugging, uh, solving for d, we're able to provide a 
we're able to pro provide a relationship between inflow rate and time step to get our D. So now, overall, we need to see what delta H is. Since we know that D prime, which is our new depth, is equal to our old D plus our change in D, and similarly with H, we are able to see what our differential in height is. And this will be uh, important in our computer simulation. So in our computer simulation, what we do is we plug in our, all our variables, and we can calculate our time step D as an H. And as soon as uh, uppercase D is greater than lowercase H, we can calculate what our total time T is. Now, there is the argument of surface tension, and this is very important that we can talk about qualitatively. So since surface tension acts upwards in the uh, opposite motion of flow, we can assume that to overcome the surface tension, we must add more mass inside our bowl for it to sink. And because of this, um, because the added mass is equal to the force of buoyancy that is acting upwards, we can assume that the force of surface tension is equal to the delta force in buoyancy, which is added up. Solving for our new delta H, we can assume that um, surface tension acts as a pseudo extra height onto our bowl. That is, when D is greater than lowercase h and delta H, then the bowl will uh, finally sink. So now we can move on into our key parameter interactions and experimental verification to determine uh, how this will work. So by having uh, 3D printed bowls sitting on shape, as seen on the desk, we're able to accurately predict and use um, very precise measurements to see the radius and the height of the bowl. So as seen, uh, we can 3D print the bowl, and these are our final results. So now we need to see the relationship between radius and height of the bowl. So by increasing the radius of our whole bowl, we need to decrease the height as well uh, to ensure that volume is the same. And as seen on the screen, we can see a uh, not only a positive correlation between our theoretical values and our experimental values, which means that our theoretical computer simulation is correct. We can also see that experimental um, and radius has to do uh, has to relate positively and linearly, uh, sorry, positively with the time sinkage. So now we can uh, see our next parameter interaction, which is the adding mass of the bowl. And likewise, we can see that our theoretical matches up almost perfectly with our experimental time. And by adding mass, we are decreasing the time, which is inversely proportional. Okay, so now we can see the radius of the whole size, and by doing this, we can also uh, see the difference between time sinkage and different radiuses, and what we get is another uh, uh, inversely proportional time between the radius of the hole and time. And second to last, uh, by changing the shape of the bowl, that is the angle of curvature and our radius at the top, we're able to see that um, it is once again positively correlated between the radius and the time of sinkage. And this matches up perfectly, um, although we don't have a theoretical uh, model, this match should match up perfectly qualitatively because uh, our height is at an angle, like our lowercase h is at an angle, so that must be overcome. So um, by modifying the thickness of the base, we can also see the difference between time and sinkage. And what we find, unsurprisingly, is that the thickness of the base doesn't actually matter with our time of sinkage. And this um, th makes sense in our theoretical model because we do not relate the, the thickness of the base to any of our experiments. And finally, we need to see the difference between temperature, density, and viscosity. So as we all know, uh, changing the temperature will change both density and viscosity. However, viscosity, um, even though uh, changing the temperature will, in fact, decrease the viscosity and decrease the uh, density. However, viscosity plays a much bigger role than viscosity in this scenario. So we can get rid of density and solely look at the viscosity of the fluid based on time sinkage. And by increasing temperature and plotting the point between viscosity and time, we're able to see a positive correlation. That is, by increasing the viscosity, by, sorry, by increasing the viscosity, there is an increase in time. Um, similarly, we could do the exact same thing with density. By adding salt and raising the temperature to a certain uh, s to a certain temperature, we're able to keep viscosity constant while changing density. And this is important because viscosity plays a much bigger role in the fluid flow of the bowl going upwards. And plotting our density to our time graph, we can see once again, it is positively linear. Um, finally, qualitatively, there is a side view of our bowl sinkage, and this is important to determine our distance over time and our velocity over time. 
So using Tracker, we're able to uh, quantitatively track where the bowl will be at a certain, at a given example. And this example is just sped up. What we get is an experimental distance over time, as seen in the red line, and a velocity over time, which is given by the influx of red dots. And modeling this with our theoretical uh, velocity over time, we see that there is somewhat a linear correlation between the two. Um, there, are, there are some limitations to the theory that there are, we need to test for other materials, which either hydrophobic or hydrophilic. We need to test for other fluids and other shapes of the bowl. In conclusion, we were able to accurately predict the sink time of the bowls, and we were able to predict the bowls' varying parameters. Right. Thank you. That was the wrong thing. Oh, sorry, my bad. of using other bowl materials would be? OK, well, this has to do with either the hydrophobic or hydrophilic material. And uh, let's say, let's take glass, for example, which is a known hydrophilic sure. material. We okay. expect the delta H to be lower. In other words, when radius decreases to a certain point, um, when ra okay. uh, we can have a smaller yep. radius yep, than the bowl still sink. Thank you. Um, so what properties of other fluids do you expect to, to change your experiment? OK, uh, well, uh, different fluids also have different viscosities, and by uh, by having a higher or lower viscosity, the inflow weight will be the th yeah. will be as, you, as you also demonstrated in your hydrophilic hydrophobic uh, comparison slide, you show that there's uh, a change in like the the bubble that forms uh, above the hole. So, yes. do you think the shape of the hole would also affect it? Um, no. Well, we assume that the hole is completely circular. Okay, and you wouldn't uh, expect anything different from pr uh, like a triangular shaped hole. Um, no, because we expect that the bubble will always take the form of sphere to minimize surface tension. Okay, thank you. Um, also, you modeled your entire uh, thing on Bernoulli's principle, but Bernoulli's principle requires that the flow must be laminar throughout. Um, how did you deal with turbulence? Because well, it beca clearly does become turbulent at a certain point. Okay, well, because the it is flowing, like it doesn't actually matter uh, as long as it's laminar inside the bowl. As long as it's laminar inside flowing through the hole, um, it will be exactly the same. And, you can verify and the once it's inside, you can verify this how? What do you mean? How, how might you verify this? L if it's laminar? Yes. Well, it's been, we'll, we know it's not turbulent because, um, well, like, just qualitatively using Okay, so you just work. looked at it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, you, you, your computer model really likes to uh, uh, depend on whether or not the depth is greater than the height of the water. But uh, it's pretty clear that the, due, due to surface tension, the height of the water does increase past the depth. How do you circumvent this with your computer, uh, computer simulation? Well, like I said, modeling surface tension, it's like a pseudo add-on to the height, where uppercase delta H plus our original lowercase okay. H. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Wait, I just like. Okay, I know it's laminar inside. Okay, yeah, but it's not really good. Okay, here. <laughs> there, right. 
claim the period during pregnancy, so there were exceptions. It didn't lie within the error. He said it's close, but it doesn't lie within the error. Can I take a laptop up? So the opposition team has about 22 seconds. I want to bring your computer up, right? Maybe your, 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 your teammates can help, help you with the tech. I think they The opposition team, hello. Hello. Are you guys ready? To Are you ready? You're like a minute and 30 seconds over time, man. Thank you, reporter, for this uh, excellent report. Uh, my name is Christopher Long, and I will be opposing problem G, Saxon Bull. Uh, so let's go over the problem statement again. Uh, a bowl with a hole in its base will sink when placed in water. The Saxons used this device for timing purposes. Investigate the parameters that determine the time of sinking, and we are checking the power. Um, so a few major tasks. Uh, first task, we're going to go over qualitatively and quantitatively explaining the phenomenon. Uh, task two, we're going to examine the effect of the major parameters on, on sinking time. And task three, we're going to look at identifying the effects of other uh, background characteristics of the system. Uh, and task four, uh, we, we want to discuss wh uh, whether or not we designed an effective experimental setup and compare it with the theoretical. So uh, just a summary of the report, we've got uh, qualitative uh, descriptions and an experimental setup, and we've got uh, a good model of sinking mechanics and a, a general quantitative model, and we also have some key uh, parameter variations. So some merits and possible next steps of the report. Uh, there was a very thorough qualitative and quantitative explanation. Uh, we, uh, there were controlled bolts that were 3D printed, and there was uh, significant amounts of data collected. Some possible next steps uh, would include the effect of the bolt shape. Uh, we, we did observe, actually, the variation of the bolt shape, but we never saw a quantification of what, uh, what effects this might have, and also the, cha uh, the changing of the bolt's material to whether or not uh, the material is hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Uh, we never saw an as uh, a slide on what assumptions were made for this model, and it would be very interesting to see uh, what was assumed uh, to determine their uh, quantitative models. Uh, controlling the bowl position, as you can see in their videos, the bowl can drift from side to side, and this would affect the uh, surface tension, uh, like the, sur the surface tension part of their model, as if the bowl were to drift off to the side, there would be no surf surface tension on one particular side of the bowl, and this is very important, and we have to control this. Um, 
theoretical models for other key parameters. As we saw, they explored multiple parameters but weren't able to produce theoretical lines uh, showing uh, certain relationships uh, in, in, the, in their later, uh, later um, stages of their slides. Uh, definitive conclusions for those exact uh, graphs and trends. Uh, there were some linear trend lines that were drawn, but there was never really a conclusion that we could actually draw from it that reliably. And finally, uh, th there was never really an ex uh, explanation for why the theory uh, di differed so much from what their uh, actual experimental data showed. And we, we would like to cover that. So now I'd like to call the reporter up for a discussion. And we, I would like to go over these four uh, major topics that you see. All so right. continuing on from our uh, questioning period earlier, uh, okay. you have your slides ready. Can I erase this? Uh, no, we, we should probably keep that. Uh, can we go to slide 13, yeah. please? So uh, when we get to slide 13, we'll see that there's actually a very, very fundamental assumption that we're making here um, that uh, for, this, uh, for the reporter's uh, model to work, D must be large enough to a certain extent so that the bowl will sink. How do we ensure that D is large enough? Do you push the bowl or is the bowl just naturally heavy? Well, firstly, yes. The bowl will be naturally heavy so that the force of gravity is equal to the force of buoyancy, which is directly correlated to the depth. So according to your model, if we use some very light uh, material, then the bowl just would not sink and would float despite yes. having a hole. Yes, intuitively. But it also has to do with the hole. It also has to do with the hole as seen. Like if the surface tension because surface tension has is an inversely proportional to the radius. So if the hole is big enough, then water will in fact okay, flow through. Thank you. Um, so uh, could you just please state any other assumptions that you've made in your in your presentation? Well, the assumption is that there um, the bowl will always be at equilibrium, like as it's flowing. Through. Uh, at equilibrium, could you define what equilibrium? Well, means? where the force of gravity is equal to the force of buoyancy. The force of gravity, and y and you know that the f uh, and you assume this tr to be true for every single time step within your computer simulation. Yes. For the force of gravity would always be equal to the force of buoyancy. Yes. So how is it that the uh, that the uh, bowl will become to sink? Well, because like I've said before, the inflow rate determines how much water actually flows into the bowl, and once in once we have an added on mass, the buoyancy the so buoyant force So then it's clear that the force of gravity cannot equal the force of buoyancy yes. because the bowl is actually in motion. Yes, that is true. But for our assumption, we can just assume that it is equal to And why each might other. be we uh, why might because we be able to do that? Because we cannot because if that were the case that FG minus F, uh, FB is actually equal to a net force which is MA we're actually unable to calculate theoretically what the acceleration would be and from this model. Have you considered any uh, fric uh, frictional or lossy forces between the flow of the fluid and the actual container? Uh like inside the bowl here? Fluid friction. Have you considered like the no. the, the forces no. of No. There's no okay. force we and assume that there's no force negligible? of No. Yeah. Okay. There's no force of viscosity. Uh can we please move to slide 18? Um you make a, an assumption that uh the temperature that you operated at just can use a coefficient of 0.61. Can you please explain yes. how you determine this? Um the the 0.61 coefficient is experimentally determined as there's no theoretical proof, but there is there like this is just due to um the coefficient of discharge. And you determine this how? It's, it's experimentally determined. Okay, so you Not just from me. Okay, so, oh, okay, so you just fit it. Yes. Okay. Um, so, slide 23. Yes. Oh, we already touched about this earlier, but I just okay. wanted to, to show you, uh, just in case like you, you uh, didn't know. Uh, we have uh, the surface tension showing up there of force of surface tension. Uh, and, and here D is greater than H. We go one slide back to slide 23, uh, uh, 22, sorry. Uh, and we can see that D is very clearly uh, cut off after H, is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, it's less okay. than H now, is it not? Yes, uh, because after, because what we're modeling is that surface tension acts as an, like, an additional uh, height to lowercase h. So what must be made is that h plus delta delta uppercase h must be overcome. And you have quantified this? Yes. OK. Um, can we go to slide 28, please? 28, of course. So as I've discussed before, there's a huge discrepancy between your uh, theoretical uh, values and your actual experimental values. Can you please explain okay. why yeah. this is So we did touch on this before, is that the force of gravity is actually always going to be greater than the force of buoyancy. So that's why the force of buoyancy wants to chase it, and the height will also want to chase the amount of water that, the mass that wants to 
go into the bowl. However, in my theoretical model, the force of gravity is always equal to the force of buoyancy, and thus it'll be a much slower So function. I propose a solution to this, actually. Perhaps using the force of gravity that you would predict for the following time step in the computer simulation might actually allow it to be more accurate, as the force of gravity would then therefore be greater. Um, so even though it's, it's not physics uh, uh, correct uh, per se, to uh, claim that the force of gravity is uh, necessarily larger than the force of buoyancy at a particular point uh, instantaneously. However, uh, for the sake of this um, computer model, it might be effective for us to just assume that the force of gravity is increasing uh, at its uh, slightly increased rate. Yes, but the thing, th I do agree that in fact, the force of gravity increases at, an, at a rate, but the thing is we're not able to accurately predict the relationship between the force of gravity and the force of buoyancy at a certain time step. All right, like uh, can we move to slide 31, please? Okay. Okay. Um, so clearly your bowls here aren't 3D printed. Yes. Um, do, uh, do you have any justification for not using 3D printed bowls here? Okay, because these bowls uh, were like represented of original Saxon bowls as the problem statement states. So by having a circular shape, like we can, like they are more representative. Okay, and uh, sorry to bring back an old topic, yep. but uh, uh, surface tension, yeah. uh, how significant do you believe it to be? Do you believe that okay. it's, it's not significant it at is all? Very significant. If I can go to our appendix, we can see experimentally calculated by having no lotion, the average time would be around 37 seconds. However, by adding lotion around the top, we were basically neglecting surface tension, and that is an increase in about three seconds. Do you have a plotted theoretical trend line showing what the effect of, uh, uh, sorry, surface tension would be on the on the time of sinking, or is it just just a table of values? It's just a table with okay. one constant. Okay. Um, can we go to uh, slide 35 and 36? All right. Okay. So you've changed the uh, thickness of, of the bottom of your bowl. Yes. But how how do you ensure that this doesn't change the mass? Mass. Of the bowl? Well, uh, we added uh, we added metal turrings to ensure that the mass actually stays constant, and we made sure of this by massing everything to be at exactly around 83 kilograms. Uh, 83 grams. 83 grams. Okay. Um, how have you add? How have you added the turrings into the uh, into the bowl? Okay. Because if the if the turrings aren't on the yeah. on the center of the bowl, okay. then there there will be an imbalance. Well, right? Like the turrings were like rods that we bent around, so it would be uh, distributed equally around the. And they were bent by hand. No, no, no. Like they were just like their original. Oh, okay. Um, so how how could you mod modify your your computer simulation for a hemispherical uh, bowl rather than okay. a, a cylindrical bowl? Um, can I write on the board? Can I? Oh. Oh, whoa, what's this? Okay, so in our theoretical model, we assume that if this is the bowl, we need to calculate a time step t in which there is like the cross sectional area multiplied by a small change in height. And by having a straight bowl, the h here will s stay constant. However, by having a circular bowl, this will actually, like, this will change. So by doing, by, uh, and it, uh, an improvement in our theoretical model would just be to uh, model what our a our height here would be, and thus we can have a relationship between delta d and our overall height. Thank you. I agree. Um, can we go on to slide 39? Yeah. Okay. So you've uh, plotted uh, an experimental uh, sort of comparison between the viscosity uh, of your f of your water and yes. the time yes. uh, required to sink. Yes. Uh, I don't believe you can actually just draw a, a, a linear conclusion here. Um, like, well, yeah. ha have you stated what conclusions you've, you've drawn from this? Well, there is a positive correlation between viscosity and, that's, and time. I do agree that it might not be it's linear. It's positive, yet your experimental yeah. shows that it increases at about so, well 0.8, and then it decreases afterwards. Is Sorry, what do you mean? Like there? Yes. Well, there are like really big error bars based on viscosity as uh, temperature changes, like the temperature before and after uh, each experiment would oh, also and change. And you, uh, do you have error bars uh, showing the error uh, th of the measured viscosity that you have? Of uh, the measured viscosity? Well, our well, I'm well we have you errors. You've measured your vis viscosity, right? Well, we use the graph up here to m plot So you use the table of values? Yes. And you varied viscosity how then? By changing temperature. By changing temperature, okay. Uh, but then doesn't your, your coefficient, your previous coefficient of 0 0.61 then change? Yes. Uh, and, you, and you accounted for this? No, because we don't have a theoretical graph. Oh, you don't because have Because we don't know the relationship between okay, the so coefficients. Okay, so you don't have a quantitative model to predict uh, the yes. effect of viscosity. Yes. Okay. And you also don't have a quantitative model, therefore, predicting the effect of temperature. 
Yes. Okay. But we do know I that. I do believe that these are actually very important uh, parameters that the reporter could have explored on. Yes. Uh, I do believe that uh, increasing the viscosity would therefore also uh, increase the amount of time required to sink. Uh, and would also just uh, have a huge effect on actually the problem statement, which is uh, use, uh, using the bowls for timing purposes. Um, and perhaps using a bowl in, a co uh, in colder weather would therefore be different from using a bowl in hotter weather. So uh, can we go to slide 44? Okay. Uh, you stated there's a linear relationship oh, uh, in our from your tracker. Okay. Yes, in our, no, in our theoretical model, we expect there to be pretty much a linear relationship with velocity over time. Okay, and you can justify this? Well, based on our theoretical line, we can uh, do that. But we can see that there's extremely large variation. Oh yeah, between our, uh, between our experimental and our theoretical. Like this is our experimental. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, wh why is it fluctuating then? Well, because um, there, well, there is error in our tracker and there is error in our theoretical model. Okay, and do you know this error? No. No, okay. Um, all right, that's about as much as we're going to touch on that. Uh, okay. Can we go to slide uh, 43? Yeah, sure. Um, so you're using tracker here to track the velocity of the bowl sinking, right? And distance, yes. A and the distance. Yes. So uh, as, as we're aware of tracker, uh, it will track any point within a 2D plane. However, this bowl and this point, as you can see, is not centered on the glass. That means there should be some refraction acting on uh, the actual tracking method of this of this bowl. Yes. So have we accounted okay. for this? Not only is the refractive uh, the refraction almost pretty much negligible, there is also it is also that it is constant throughout uh, throughout the bowl. That is that is like over here versus down later down there, they'll have the they'll have the exact same refractive index. So it is constant throughout, and thus our predictions will still be correct. Okay, I do believe that this is very unreliable, uh, like uh, a potentially, uh, a potential source of unreliability. Yeah. Um, uh, so can we also go to, uh, we've covered that. Um, 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have left? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, so uh, ba back to hydrophilic and hydrophobic materials. All right. Um, We've also touched about uh, upon this in discussion. Uh, what do you think the effect of time, uh, uh, like effect on time, would be if you used? Uh, um, there actually is no effect on time, as this is, let's say, like a guard crossing. As long as it is broken to begin with, it'll always flow through. So the hydrophobic and hydrophilic yes. only di only dictate whether it will whether or not it will sink. Okay, yes. I agree with that. Um, so thank you for this discussion, right, and we you. will move move on to concluding mar remarks. All right, thank you. Oh, does reviewer ask me now? Uh, no. When does my minute start? Okay, uh, so in, in our discussion uh, between me and myself and the reporter, uh, we've talked about uh, many different parameters, uh, such as, uh, uh, sorry, so, um, such as surface tension, uh, as well as uh, the size of the hole, the viscosity of the water, the temperature of the water, et cetera. And I believe that the reporter's uh, views uh, aligned with mine and his explanations were sufficient. He, however, did not really uh, account sufficiently for the discrepancies between his theory and his experiment. And as I've already suggested, I believe that this could have been avoided. Um, we also did not uh, mention too much uh, the effects of drag and frictional forces between the flow and the uh, actual bowl, but I do believe that the materials of the bowl and then the frictional forces between the flow uh, and, and the bowl and also the material of the, uh, and also the drag acting on the bowl would have actually been uh, quite significant and would have been something that the reporter could have went into. Uh, so I uh, thank you so much for your time and that is all. Um, yes, we, in, well, uh, well, yes, based on our, yes, yeah. yes, I assume. okay, well, this isn't position, but yes, I can. Um, well, yes, I do, in fact, there is, in fact, uh, there is, but it is negligible because just the magnitude. Yes.
So you, for the coefficient of discharge, how did you obtain the value of 0 0.61? Um, it, it, like I said before, it is experimentally, experimentally determined by other scientists. So from literature? And, yes. I see. And what parameters does this coefficient of discharge depend on? Is you, I, I believe you mentioned it depends yeah. on temperature. Temperature, yes. Is this the only parameter? Uh, I believe so. And also the fluid. But 0 0.61 is right, just for Right, so water. it doesn't depend on the pre Are you saying that it doesn't depend on the pressure drop across the orifice? No, I don't believe so. I see. And so, okay, to the opponent, what yes. so you brought up the importance of geometry. What do you think is the main effect of changing the inside geometry of your bowl? Uh, it should be able, uh, it should change the effect of Laplace pressure, I believe, on the... The uh, Laplace pressure? Yeah, on, on whether or not the bowl will initially I see. Sink. And then to the reporter, do you agree with this? Um, yes. Does it change, does the inside geometry change anything else? Um, well, of course, it will change the sink time. Okay, I see. What about the outside geometry? To the opponent first. Uh, w uh, what would you define as outside geometry? So the outside, so the keeping the inside geometry constant, does the outside geometry change the phenomenon? Uh, it, sh it should if yes. uh, you're changing the shape of the bowl. So what's the main effect of this? Uh, well, depending on uh, how effective you've, ch uh, how you've changed the shape, uh, the, uh, it will affect the uh, thinking time. Okay, enter the reporter, like. what um, do you think? It'll definitely change the viscosity force going, uh, like the force of viscosity and drag. However, like I said before, it is negligible in our theoretical it's model. It's negligible? Yes. Okay, I see. So, uh, to the reporter, wh what numerical method did you use to solve your differential equation? Was it um, Euler's method? Like, sorry, what? Like so, so solve your equations of motion. Did you use Euler's method? Yes, Euler's method for my... So, Euler's equation. method is prone to error. Do you agree? Yes, I do. So, do you have a convergence plot of your solution? Uh, no. So, you have no way of actually ensuring the accuracy of your Euler's method, right? Um, but by having a higher time step, we can then, uh, there's a more qualitative explanation of Euler's method. I see, but That's you didn't actually numerically verify the accuracy of your solution, did you? Yes. No. Okay, I see. So would this potentially, to the opponent, would this potentially explain the deviations between theory and experiment? I do believe so, yes. Okay, I see. To the reporter, how, how, what was the ratio of your bowl volume to the container volume that you used? Um, well, like, my, the material, it's no, one. No, no, the bowl's volume itself versus the uh, surrounding, the container volume that you sunk the bowl in. Oh, um, well, I don't, that think that I don't think that's, I don't think that matters because. So does your, does the, does the height of the surrounding water rise due to your bowl sinking? Um, well, yes, but it does not matter on the volume of the other. Okay, other so when you initially bowl. release the bowl to the opponent, do you think there's any other part of this phenomenon that has been missed out by the reporter? Uh, from the initial release of the bowl? Initial release of the bowl. Uh, I do believe that the uh, cross-sectional area of the bottom of the bowl might I affect see. it. Did you observe oscillations to the reporter when you released the bowl? Yes, there are oscillations. However, we cannot model the oscillations as water will already model start. It? Because water will already start flowing through experimentally. And so what were your initial release conditions? Um, we would just drop it directly at the height, at, at the water level. I see. And then, okay, for your graphs, uh, for comparison with theory and experiment, what is the main reason for the deviation between the two? Um, like I said before, our, the our theory oversimplifies that the force of gravity is equal to the force of buoyancy. So you agree that your theory is oversimplified? Um, it is simplified to an extent. Oh, okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, okay. Wait, am I, do I not give my report? Okay. Uh, can I give it right now? Okay. <laughs> So okay. So in conclusion, um, as a reporter, I was able huh? to accurately predict the sink time of the bowls given different parameters, what? and I was also able to <laughs> have a variety of bowl sizes and bowl parameters. Like I'm supposed to present this before. No, it's the viewer and it's good very good. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Wait. I thought she told like we skipped over it completely. Okay, okay, okay. Sure. Four minutes, right? <sighs> oh, no, but that was Dave's point. <laughs> it's Dave, though. So five by two minutes. Okay. We made it to top three. That's not all that matters. You can unplug mine if you want. Okay. So uh. No, apparently it's wrong. Oh, is this your laptop?
<coughs> oh, we have three Razer laptops. So one, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Reviewer takes the floor, yeah. Okay, can I just unplug this and plug in mine? Testing, testing. Hello, hello. We have two dead members in the network. You and Eric. Yeah, you were dead. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Dave, and today I'll be the reviewer for problem number six, stacks and bowls. So a problem statement has already been said by a reporter, and the sta task that we can derive from this problem statement is to first qualitatively explain the restrictive forces affecting the time of sync. As, as we are investigating the time of sync, it is important to export a, uh, have a thorough investigation into all the phenomena slowing down the bowl, for, uh, impeding the motion of the bowl. Task two is to construct a control experimental setup with precise bowl construction, which I believe the reporter has done well. Task three is to derive a quantitative theoretical model to predict the full motion of the bolt, which I believe can be improved upon. And finally, uh, task four is to verify the theoretical model by wearing the key parameters. So uh, the report, report went as following. I believe they had a good qualitative understanding of the phenomenon and satisfactory quantitative modeling, but they had a little systematic investigation into the different resistive forces uh, to model the motion of the bolt. So the theoretical analysis began with a qualitative explanation of the different phases of the motion. Then they went into the conditions for their bowl to sink with the Laplace pressure and ended their theory with modeling the fluid motion. Their experimental started with a precise 3D print con uh, to uh, construct their bowls. Then they varied their key parameters and then compared their theory and experiment but lacked an explanation for their deviations. So the reporter merits are as follows. They had a controlled experimental setup and precise construction of their bowl. They had a thorough qualitative explanation and clear diagrams and clear answers to the opposition questions. However, I believe by neglect they, they had a limited theoretical scope as they neglected the uh, motion of the bowl entirely. And this might lead to um, uh, obs observing the uh, incorrect phenomena as they did, not, they did not model the motion of the bowl as it sinks through the fluid and only the fluid in a quasi-static assumption, which the opponent brought up later on. They didn't model the effect or coefficient of discharge on the pressure drop, which I believe is crucial and known to be valid in literature. So modeling the coefficient of discharge as a cons constant might be the source of their deviations. They also lacked an explanation into the convergence and accuracy of their Euler's method. They also uh, had little explanation into decoupling the inside and outside geometry, as the inside geometry only changes the volume of the bowl, while the outside geometry changes the drag by decomposing it into form drag and skin friction. They also lacked a systematic investigation into their different parameters, as they uh, um, lacked an explanation for their deviations. The key insights of the opponent were to first in, uh, the effects of bowl shape and material, uh, the lacking conclusive data uh, c in comparison between theory and experiment, and the key assumptions of their model. So the uh, so opponent rightly brought up the effect of bowl shape and discussed the disc discrepancy between theory and experiment and disputed the invalid assumption of a quasi-static bowl position with force of gravity always equal to the buoyancy force. However, they lacked the discussion on the bowl's motion and the importance, modeling, the importance of modeling the full motion by modeling the drag forces acting on the bowl. They didn't bring up the dependence of the coefficient on discharge on the pressure drop, and they lacked a focus on resistive forces. So the first point raised was the motion of the bowl, which was neglected by the uh, reporter, and we partially agree with the opponent that this should be investigated by solving the differential equations of motion. The coefficient of discharge, um, w uh, the opponent brought up that, uh, the opponent questioned the origins of this coefficient, and while the reporter said it was accurate characterization, we disagree with both the opponent and reporter, and we believe a more ac empirical model should be used by characterizing it through an independent experiment by tracking the fluid draining through a similar sized hole and modeling coefficient of discharge as a function of pressure. Then they discussed the decoupling of parameters between the mass and geometry. The opponent brought up that there's a non-consistent mass distribution and geometry cannot be changed without changing the mass. The reporter said that the theory could still be verified, but the effect is negligible. Uh, thus, the effect is negligible. We agree with the opponent since the mass distribution should be kept constant and the tilt should be investigated. And uh, mass should be constant while changing the geometry of the bowl. 
So some of the missed physics were the bowl's motion, including oscillation and tilt of the bowl itself, and decomposing the drag forces into their skin friction and form drag, respectively. Experimentally, they could, have, they could have had a more accurate empirical characterization of their coefficient of discharge and the initial conditions of the bowl, which changed the final motion. Thank you. In conclusion, okay. I don't think that was that good. Okay, so in conclusion, I was able to accurately predict the same time of the bowl using a uh, theoretical computer simulation and Euler's method, and I was able to predict multiple parameters and explain the relationship between that and our time and sink. From our discussion with my opponent, I was um, able to uh, see the, uh, that. An, ink, an improvement could be made with the different heights and different shapes of bowl and geometry. And, I, and from our reviewer, I was able to uh, see that there is a more pred accurate prediction from the displacement over time. So overall, I think I have answered the problem statement. Thank you. <coughs> so, I have to. S should should work. Okay, I can yell. Uh, so, quick question for the uh, the reporter. Um, you s mentioned that the density of the fluid doesn't uh, isn't super effective, right? It's kind of you had just this linear effect. Is there a critical value of density that you think would change the physics of this problem? Um, there may be, but it is not experimentally determined, nor theoretically. Okay. A follow-up question. Um, you varied the density of one of the objects involved in this uh, experiment, but you can vary the density of the other object. So I ask again, do you think there is a specific density of the bowl that might result in Oh, of the bowl or of the water? Of the, well, I mean either, but you can't really... I, oh, I, oh. I agree with your point that trying okay. to get the Well, of the bowl, uh, yeah. by increasing the density and while well, keeping the volume the same, um, there would be an increase in mass. So the bowl, yes, would sink faster. There would be a different time sink. Yeah, I mean, the answer I'm looking for is that if the, if the bowl's density is low enough, it won't sink regardless of what oh, you do. Oh, yes, because uh, the density directly correlates with the force of gravity, which correlates with mass. So my question is for the reporter, and that is, uh, in one of your slides, you have labeled a uh, variable delta capital D. Um, which was, I believe, the which difference in the height between uh, outside the bowl. or the change in height outside during the, the time step outside yeah. of the yes. container. Yes. Is that a fun uh, outside of the bowl? Yes. Is that going to vary if you change your container? Yes, because sample? that has to do directly with the the displaced the weight of the displaced liquid that the bowl creates when sinking, and that has to do with the cross sectional area multiplied by the delta d. So changing the cross sectional area would definitely change delta d. Okay, so is it proportional or opposite? Um, well, s probably proportional. Like, if I increase, if I increase area, if you, I if you make the the container bigger, will yeah. that delta D be bigger or smaller? Smaller. Okay, thank you. For the reporter, um, you had one uh, slide with the theoretical points all above <coughs> the experimental ones. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that's a good fit Sorry, between you theory and experiment? Can you repeat the question? You had your theoretical points were all above yeah. the experimental points. Do you think that's a good fit or not? And um, what would you base it on? Well, I do think it is a. I think it is a general good fit because the trend line is. Similar, however, um, our theoretical model does not accurately predict because there is a difference in the time step, which can be improved. Okay, for the opponent, uh, you mentioned a few parameters like turbulence, temperature. Um, yeah. Do you think those impor those are important? Yes, no, and how would you determine if they're important? Uh, yes, they are important, and uh, as I've mentioned before, and I think 
Uh, the best way to determine whether or not they are important, um, experimentally probably ver uh, verifying it. Uh, if not, as we've already mentioned before, the uh, coefficient that T uses uh, from, a, from lit literature uh, depends on temperature. So we already know from previous literature that uh, temperature will affect viscosity and it will also uh, therefore be important. And what would tell you, what would tell you if that dependence is important or not? Uh, uh, pardon me, uh, would, you, would you mind repeating that? Yeah, what, what would tell you whether or not that dependence on temperature is important or not? Uh, the you said you'd measure it experimentally. What, what exactly would you measure? Uh, for the coefficient or, uh, well, uh, what I would probably do is I would just take the, uh, take the bowl, put it at different temperatures uh, for water, and then uh, just uh, sink, sink the bowl at different, uh, at different uh, water temperatures. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. For Good the question. reporter, for the reviewer rather, um, you mentioned that there is uh, an importance of outside versus inside geometry with respect to drag forces. And you also mentioned that you can model the coefficient of discharge as a function of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, how did, you, did you do those, uh, did you carry that out? And if so, what was the result of that? For uh, did I carry it out in my own experiment? Yes. So we modeled coefficient of discharge as a function of the pressure drop across the orifice. And we were able to find that it is so uh, we found a good agreement between literature, other literature uh, experiments done on the same thing on the dependence on the pressure drop across the orifice for the coefficient of discharge. And how much does it deviate from the results that were presented? And is it important in your opinion? We found that the coefficient of discharge, okay, within the range of our, test, uh, of our testing, uh, of our experiment, we found the coefficient of discharge ranged from 0 0.2 to 0 0.61, depending on the pressure. Okay, so do you think it's important or not? Yes, I believe it is greatly important because it, its ra range of deviation is over 100%. Thank you. Are there experiments with more time? Uh, yes. Oh, so this question is maybe just out of curiosity because I saw uh, many solutions of this same problem and like the other container, the container where you put your your main, yeah, your bowls. Like, does that matter? Because it seemed to me that in one of your videos, it was like they were really close. This, the shape, yeah, the sizes were comparable. Oh, like, so like what the reviewer said? Yeah, like for for all of you. Oh, yeah, for all of you, what, like. Okay, so. What um, do you think? Do you want me to go first? Um, well, I think from our theoretical model, uh, we predict that it wouldn't actually have an effect. That is the water line and not the volume of the water inside. So placing this in, let's say, a very small, tub versus a really big bathtub would not have an effect. Okay. Uh, yeah, so to, uh, as I've already mentioned in, in my uh, opposition, uh, you can also uh, like generally observe that so long as the bowl is not touching any of the sides, the effect of surface tension should not change. Um, I do believe that you were touching upon uh, when, when we showed the tracker video in the reporter's presentation, the bowl appears to be about approximately the same size as the, as the actual container. I do believe that's just an effect of refraction and it, the bowl itself is actually small. Yeah, I don't think it's, uh, okay. Okay, so I believe there, I actually um, slightly disagree with both of you. So I think there are two effects of the outside container. One is the change, of, so if, you're, if the ratio of the volume of your container is, compa is comparable in the order of magnitude to your bowl, there will actually be a height increase of the surrounding water level. That's the first aspect of it, which increases the pressure drop. However, secondly, we notice that initially when we drop our bowl, we notice initial oscillations. If the period of this initial oscillations matches up with the resonant, fre uh, with the resonant frequencies of the waves in our tube due to the shear stress on the sides of our bowl, this will actually, call re this will actually cause resonance between the water waves and the bowl itself, which may lead to a different phenomenon. Thank you. It works. Which one is it? A lot of <laughs> Sure. Uh, so a question for the uh, opponent first. So you mentioned turbulence, right? Yes. Um, why do you think it's important, this problem? Uh, for Bernoulli's principle to hold true, which is what the entire uh, theoretical model is based on, uh, the flow must be uh, laminar throughout the uh, pseudo pipe system. So, so how do you get turbulence in this system? Uh, well, you can qualitatively observe that th there's a sort of rippling uh, at the top of the bowl uh, in the videos that were shown, and that indicates that the flow does eventually become turbulent at a certain point uh, okay. within. 
And a question for the, well, this is weird, but it's okay, good, thanks. Um, a question for the reporter. So the opponent mentioned refraction in your tracker okay, yeah. thing, right? Yes. Um, and you mentioned that it was not really important. Why do you think that? Um, well, our tracker was just a, another, like, an add-on to our quantitative theory, just to prove that uh, the velocity over time actually does match up ex with our experiment. Like, that's why we use tracker. That so is it important or not? Wait, what? Is, is it important or? It is just to prove, once again, that our experiment lines up with our theory. Don't have much time. We'll have like one more question, I guess. Uh, you guys have different shapes of bowls. You have metal bowls and plastic bowls. How do you ensure that they're the same mass? Do you do you like put mass in the plastic bowls or? Um. Well, for the plastic bowls, um, some of them wouldn't sink, so I had to increase the mass all around. So at 83 grams, which w is what I did in my experiment for all my plastic bowls, they would all sink. Did and you I can like ensure apply that. it like symmetrically to like how, how did yeah. you? Apply yeah. Yeah. Oh, so uh, I'll just like go to it. So like I added it symmetrically around just to just to minimize the amount of tilt okay. Okay. and increase surface tension. Thank you for all of the further questions. So we'll just have like five minutes for you guys to fill out all your score sheets, and then we will announce the scores in the score room. All right. for the reviewer.
Testing? Testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Can you, can you, can you turn this back? Can you turn the volume off? This one, this one, this one. Testing, 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 testing. Right, right, okay. I, I, I'm trying to, uh, like I can, I can turn the game down a little bit. You, turn, you don't have to turn, turn, I just turn it away. They're not even turn, they're not turned off. They're all turned off. I'll remove this one. Okay. Good afternoon, can I ask for help, please? Testing. Testing. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. That works too. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Uh, can you can you make? Do you have another laptop? Hello? 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 What happened? Testing, 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 one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Oh. 
Pulpit. One, two, three, one, two, three. Hello? Yeah. I have no clue why it didn't work. Because now I plug in both of them, both of them, HDMI, and they work very good. Like, like one, two, three. So I have no clue. One, two, three. Yeah. So people online can hear me saying testing. Like one, two, three, one, two, three. Hello? We have all of our jurors here, uh, all 10 are here. So then uh, we will start our second stage. Okay. So in the second stage, we have, okay. So could the uh, reporter come on stage for preparation? Reporter, you, where's your computer? Computer, okay, good. Microphone, I have too many, I have too many, I guess. But, uh, why is my, mm. but I guess.
f for okay. When the reporter is presenting, I will show my I will show the clock. We'll use this clock now. The legit clock. Do you have that one? No, 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 no. That's the uh, okay. You take the document cam. This one. This one. You take this one. Live stream, all right. Huh? Ti okay, time, you can see it a little bit. Okay. Is our live stream all right? Our volunteer? Good. Okay. So, uh, I guess you may be. Oh wait, uh, one second. We uh, have to switch it to the right. Okay. You may begin. Uh, so the problem statement for this problem is that a line drawn with a pencil on paper can be electrically conducting. Investigate the characteristics of the conducting line. So uh, a couple notes on this problem statement. So first, the problem statement asks for a line to be drawn with a pencil on paper. So we used a graphite pencil on a piece of paper. And uh, we are testing the electrical resistivity of the line, uh, which is dependent on conductivity. And so the characteristics that we chose to investigate uh, were the length of the line, the width of the line, the hardness of the pencil used to draw the line, and the temperature of the line. So uh, I will begin with a, an introduction, uh, giving a qualitative, ex qualitative explanation of why the phenomenon works like it does. Then we will move into my experimental setup, followed by our theoretical model, uh, and then key parameter interactions, and finally a conclusion. So um, first here we can see a video of the phenomenon. And so when the multimeter's probes are put onto the line, we can see we get a resistivity reading, indicating that the line is conductive. Now, the reason why graphite is conductive is because of its structure. So as you can see in graphite, we do have delocalized electrons. And so what this means is that these electrons are free to move in between the layers of graphite. Since we do have electrons free to move, uh, these electrons can conduct charge, rendering the graphite conductive. Uh, one other explanation of the phenomenon that we need to discuss is how pencil actually rubs onto paper. So uh, we can look at paper as kind of a sticky grater surface. And so essentially what it does is when the pencil rubs over the paper, the paper scrapes some of the graphite off and holds it to the paper. Um, so now we can discuss the experimental setup. So um, the experimental setup was using a ruler in order to determine the length of the line, um, naturally the pencil. Multi a multimeter was used to calculate the resistivity of the line and a heat gun was used to either control or vary the temperature. Uh, and here we can see the heat gun at work. You simply point it at the line and it reads the temperature at that point. So uh, some of the methods that we should go over first is that the line is drawn over 50 times with the pencil sharpened to a fine point. And for the width of the line, we use a caliper in order to measure it. Um, in terms of varying the temperature, temperatures around negative 10 degrees Celsius were achieved using a freezer. Uh, around zero degrees Celsius using a fridge, around 20 degrees Celsius at room temperature, thermostat variations giving a slightly larger range of temperatures around this point, and temperatures around 40 degrees Celsius achieved using a hair dryer. So the theoretical model will be as follows. First, we will discuss the length and the width of the line. Then we will discuss the hardness of the pencil used to draw the line. And finally, we will discuss the temperature of the line. Um, so first, once again, we can see the uh, image of what a uh, pencil line drawn on paper looks like. And at the bottom, we can see an exaggerated cross section where basically the grooves in the paper allow graphite to be scraped off. Now, what's important to note is that since we did apply the line 50 times over, these grooves were flattened down by the time the uh, 50th stroke was laid down. Uh, at this point, what is holding the graphite onto the paper is intermolecular forces such as the London dispersion force. So um, with this in mind, we can now go into our governing equations. So we have that resistance equals the resistivity times the length divided by the cross-sectional area. And the cross-sectional area can be further subdivided into width 
time depth. And so now we can look at our experimental data. So here we see the resistance versus the width of the line, and we see an inversely proportional trend. Uh, and this matches with the fact that um, we do have resistance inversely proportional to the width of the line. Then we have the resistance versus the length of the line. And once again, we do see that this fits with our theoretical model because the length of the line is directly proportional to the resistance. Uh, in terms of the depth of the line, in fact, varying the number of strokes doesn't actually significantly change the depth. Instead, what it does is it ensures that the whole area of the paper containing the line is covered with graphite. And the reason why we used 50 strokes is, as you can see here, the error bars on our resistance readings decreased significantly. So we used a sample size of five, and those are the standard deviations. Um, and so what we can see is that as we uh, get to 50 strokes, not only does our resistance tend to a set value, but uh, we also have our error bars shrinking. And so this was our justification behind treating depth as a constant, and also our uh, justification behind using 50 strokes as opposed to some other number of strokes for all of our other uh, trials. So now onto the second part of our theoretical model, which is the hardness of the pencil. So this is an extremely simplified version of what a piece of pencil lead looks like before it is applied onto paper. So on the outside, you have wax, which is removed when the pencil is sharpened. Uh, and on the inside, you have some amount of clay and some amount of graphite. Now, the way that manufacturers vary the hardness of their pencils is by changing the amount of clay in the pencil. So uh, here we have G being the graphite composition as a fraction of the total composition of the pencil. Now, since both clay and wax have resistivities that are several orders of magnitude greater than the resistivity of graphite, we can treat them both as non-conductive. What this means is that we can uh, take our old expression for the cross-sectional area of the line and actually multiply that by the fraction of the cross-sectional area that is able to conduct electricity, notably the graphite component of that cross-sectional area. Uh, putting this once again into our main equation, we get that the resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length divided by width times depth times graphite composition. What's important to note here is that the resistivity is actually just the resistivity of graphite itself without taking into account clay since we are treating both, uh, since we are treating clay as non-conductive. What this means is that we can actually have values for both, um, uh, we can have values for the rho, uh, the resistance, and the cross-sectional area. What this allows us to then do is uh, actually calculate, uh, using our experimental data, the graphite content of the various pencils. Now, it's important to note that uh, the graphite content of pencils varies across manufacturer. So this information is not readily provided uh, simply online, but we were able to experimentally calculate it using our theory. And we do see that as graphite content increases, we have a decrease in resistance, uh, which is what our theory would predict. Now, finally, into the last part of our theoretical model. And this is the temperature dependence of resistance. So once again, we can see uh, why graphite is conductive. It is because electrons are free to move in between the various layers in the graphite. At the bottom, we can see a diagram of the various bands that electrons can occupy in a material um, and the energy at those various bands. So in an insulator, we see that the valence band, where electrons aren't conducting, and the conduction band, where electrons are conducting, are separated by quite a large band gap. Meanwhile, in conductors on the other end of the spectrum, we have the conduction band and the valence band right next to each other. This means that all, or at least most, electrons are conducting. Uh, in the middle, we have a semiconductor. And what we see with a semiconductor is that there is a small band gap between the valence band and the conduction band. And what this means is that if we increase the energy of some of the electrons in the valence band, we are actually able to get them to bridge the band gap and jump into the conduction band. Since graphite is a semiconductor, this explains why we see a decrease in resistance uh, with an increase in temperature. So um, using the fit here, which is that the resistance uh, is a function of temperature, um, we can actually begin to work on a solution to the equation seen in the second block of equations there at the top, uh, R equals R naught times one plus T alpha. Alpha is the temperature coefficient of resistance that we are now going to solve for. So um, using our fit, we are actually able to calculate the resistance at zero degrees Celsius, and using the resistance at zero degrees Celsius and plugging it back into our equation, what we are able to do is we are able to actually get an alpha. 
So with this alpha, uh, we can convert it then into parts per million per Kelvin from parts per, uh, from per degree Celsius. And so since we used our experimental data to actually uh, calibrate our equations here, we can't directly experimentally verify our results. However, in a scientific paper uh, called Graphite on Paper as Material for Sensitive Thermoresistive Sensors, uh, we actually see that R alpha, displayed at the bottom, negative 3,700 parts per million per Kelvin, uh, falls within the range of alphas suggested by the paper. This indicates that both our experimental um, setup and our theory were uh, quite good. It is important to note that what we have here is a linear trend. This linear trend is only true locally. In fact, as we begin to cross uh, temperatures of around 100 degrees Celsius, we begin to see the trend switch from linear into something with more curvature. Uh, however, since our data does not span into temperatures that high, we, don't, we can treat it as linear since it is linear locally. And what we also see is that graphite switches from behaving like a semiconductor to behaving like a conductor at even higher temperatures, uh, around 400 degrees Celsius to 600 degrees Celsius. And so what basically happens is that when this switch occurs, uh, graphite be, uh, ha happens to behave like a conductor. However, once again, in the temperatures we tested, graphite behaves like a semiconductor. Okay, now a quick summary of the key parameters. So width has a negative correlation to resistance. Length has a positive correlation to resistance. Graphite content has a negative correlation to resistance. And finally, temperature has a negative correlation to resistance. So what we found, uh, once again reiterating the problem statement, a line drawn with a pencil on paper can be electrically conducting. Investigate the characteristics of the conducting line. So um, using a pencil line on paper, we found that resistance is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area of the line, and that the depth is dependent on the paper byte depth, but in reality, the paper byte gets smoothed out with the 50 strokes that we applied. Uh, and we also know that resistance is proportional to length. Uh, we know that pencil hardness is dependent on clay content, uh, which is simply the total composition uh, minus the graphite content. And we also know that resistance is inversely proportional to graphite content. Finally, in terms of the temperature of the line, we know that graphite behaves like a semiconductor for the range of temperatures which we tested. And so this indicates a negative correlation between resistance and temperature. And finally, resistance is locally proportional to temperature. Thank you. So, two minutes for the opponent to ask questions. Hello? So to the reporter, uh, let's say I had a line drawn on the paper once on like a standard piece of paper. What do you think, it, other than the length and the width, is the most important parameter that affects the resistance of the paper? Uh, given one... Give one, uh, the, the most important parameter that affects the resistance of your line. Uh, well, it's hard to say most important because both the length and the cross-sectional area do affect the line, but uh, we'd argue that it is probably the dimensions of the line themselves. Okay. The dimensions of the line itself, okay. So um, you indicated in your experimental setup that you actually used a voltmeter with probes. Uh, with the probes, are you, have you verified if your contact points are ohmic? Sorry, what? Have you verified that your contact points are ohmic? I, ca I can't hear you over the <laughs> Have you verified your contact points are ohmic? Uh, we, uh, so what we see with the trend line is that we do have it proportional to length and inversely proportional to width and depth, which is characteristic of an ohmic resistor. Okay. So, um, So uh, we can't directly predict this, uh, considering that we calculated our graphite content. Okay. Th thank you. So um, you mentioned that in your slides you have an alpha value for your actual temperature, and they have a theory for their actual resistance as well as their temperature. You, uh, can you actually reproduce the theory that, uh, or have some reproducible phenomena that looks like they have in the paper? I'm sorry. Uh, can you reproduce the conditions that they had in the paper? We did not reproduce the conditions that they had in the paper. Mm -hmm. However, they did use a pencil line mm -hmm. drawn on paper. Okay, so you also, you also mentioned that you've measured the depth of the actual pencil line. Uh, are you sure this is consistent with the value that you used, that the paper used? Uh, we are not 100% sure that this is consistent, but, but mm -hmm. however, it tends to be the same for standard values of paper, and this difference is negligible. Mm -hmm. So depending on the test,
Thank you, everyone. Hello, my name is Li Yang Chen, and on Team Tentacore, and today I'm pro uh, opposing problem number 10, conducting lines. So the problem statement is as follows, and we drew a uh, line with a pencil on paper can be electrically conducting, investigate the characteristics of the conducting line. So a list of tasks we drafted up are first to firstly, qualitatively explain why pencil lines are conductive, which we think that the reporter has some mix misconceptions about. Secondly, to conduct a controlled experimental setup with two very key parameters, which we think is lacking on the reporter's part because a lot of the important parameters have not actually been controlled well. Thirdly, to model the effect of pressure and surface roughness on resistance, which we think there are also some misconceptions that we will clear up as we uh, move into a discussion. And fourthly, to verify a theoretical model with experimental data, which, uh, has, uh, which we'll also talk about in the discussion period. So as a summary of the report, the reporter first gave a qualitative explanation of why graphite conducts, which we think uh, has a lot of chemistry to it and is good, but however, there are certain misconceptions we have to clear up about graphite on paper. Secondly, that they've given an experimental setup with temperature variation, but there are many lack of controls on the actual parameters vary. Thirdly, the key parameter interactions, which they talked about the length of the line, the width of the line, and, um, uh, and the actual temperature they vary. However, we think that uh, there are certain misconceptions with uh, their actual measure, their with their measurements, so for example, the force applied, as well as the actual depth of the line. And fourthly, that there are limitations of their setup, uh, the limitations of their experimental setup that comes with this lack of control. So some merits of the report are firstly, that there is a good qualitative explanation of why, a uh, clear qualitative explanation of why the graphite actually con uh, actually is conductive. However, we don't think, uh, we think that there's actually a difference between graphite normally and graphite on paper. Secondly, that they have a good communication of certain intuitive ideas. So for example, the semiconductor sheets as well as the, bound elect uh, the electron bounds. And thirdly, they have a thorough qualitative explanation of trends and temperature dependence of resistance, which we think uh, they've gotten some of the uh, charts for. So some possible next steps are firstly, the impact of non-omic con uh, contacts. So as a line is actually drawn on paper, when, uh, when uh, the contacts of the line are non-omic, this actually causes hysteresis in the system by actually varying the, uh, by, by varying the actual structure of the line as electricity passes through it. So, so the, the line's uh, resistance might change depending on, how, uh, depending on uh, the contacts. Uh, secondly, that there was no control over surface roughness, which we actually believe is the most important parameter in, in the experiment of the conducting line. A rough pencil and a, on a smooth, pe uh, a rough piece of paper and a smooth piece of paper will uh, greatly vary the actual resist resistance of the line. Thirdly, there is no actual control over the pressure applied and the velocity of sliding, and they have not provided any. Uh, they have not provided. Uh, the actual control over, for example, how they drew, how exactly they drew the lines on paper, and the velocity of how they uh, of the paper, for example, and these are important parameters that we think need to be controlled in order to uh, in in order to investigate this phenomenon thoroughly. Secondly, the, there's a limited experimental scope, so there's no actual quantitative prediction for for resistance across varying parameters. So, for example, um, giving uh, for, uh so we would like to actually uh talk about the quantitative uh, prediction. For example, how uh, resistances, resistance directly uh, varies with the inverse of pressure. And for example, how, how these parameters can actually change quantitatively instead of just showing uh, specific trends. There's also little explanation about how this graphite is deposited onto paper. And these qualitative results are fitted with graphs and there's a lack of overall systematic investigation of various parameters as well as the, actu uh, as well as the actual effects of the graphite on paper. So I would like to investigate, uh, I would like to uh, invite the reporter up uh, for a discussion now. Uh, so the first point we will get into into the qualitative explanation of graphite on paper. So let's say I have a rough surface, which is the paper. And I have a pencil here, and I'm drawing this pe pencil over the surface of the paper. How does the graphite actually deposit on the paper? So uh, what happens is that this piece of the paper will shear some of the graphite off and it will be deposited on the paper how where it will be held in by a line. How does this shear actually, uh, how does this shear actu actually demonstrate it physically? So is it from a force, from an impact, or? Uh, so it is, it is a frictional force between this and this. There's a frictional force between this and this. Um, okay, so for, uh, so as I draw, sorry, okay. as I draw a pencil over this line, for example, some of the wells get filled of the, of the line, right? Right. So um, you talked about in your, in your report how there you, you used uh, 50 lines for your experiment. Can you draw, for example, uh, can you draw me a graph of, for example, R to the number of lines you actually drew on the paper? So if this is zero line, or uh, if this is like one, one line drawn to like your 50 lines drawn, uh, how does the, res sorry, resistance R? 
How is the number of lines actually? How does the resistance actually vary with the number of lines drawn? So uh, it is it is asymptotic, but it reaches a it it reaches a theoretical minimum uh, as you get uh, um, to more. Why do you think strokes. this occurs? Uh, we believe this occurs because it flattens down the bytes on the paper to the point where mm. it cannot uh, retain any more graphite at that point. Mm. So if I deposit gra uh, graphite on the paper, are you saying it's the actual surface roughness is smoothed out and there's some graphite deposited? Yes. So we actually disagree with the statement. Perfect. So um, we think the actual surface roughness of the paper is still the same. However, because the graphite is uh, depositing over the, the wells of the actual paper, the overall roughness of the paper doesn't change, but the effective roughness due to this graphite deposited actually changes. So it becomes a frac, uh, as you said, but it's a fractional of the original roughness. However, sorry, let me finish. However, the actual roughness of your original piece of paper doesn't actually change. Uh, but wouldn't you agree that the pencil mm. applies a force on this uh, bump, causing it to be flattened? Um, the pressure that you apply, uh, any pressure will cause those don't bites actually to be flattened? We don't actually think this is the case because that, pr uh, that pressure may have, ne uh, have effects on uh, the, the primary driving mechanism of why the pencil is deposited on the paper is because of a certain shear stress that, uh, that acts on the paper when the pencil actually hits one of the bumps. So this, an, this actually shears off some of the paper, some of the, uh, some of the lead of the paper. It doesn't actually directly apply a pressure downward. Do you agree? Uh, no, because the, this pencil is still sliding this way along mm. the paper, right? And so both, both your idea mm. about the, the bit of graphite being sheared off and, your, uh, and my idea about the pencil actually flattening these bumps because of the force uh, of the pencil being slid over that way are true. When the pencil is slid over the bumps, it does damage the bumps. And over 50 strokes, the bumps do get smoothened out. So yes, while mm. the shear force applied is what is removing the graphite from the pencil, it does still flatten the bumps over time. Okay, so, so does that mean the width, of the width of your, does the depth of your actual paper, does the thickness of your paper change as you draw lines over, over, over this piece of paper? So, so the thickness of the paper does not change, right? This is the thickness of so the paper the thickness below of the, the bumps. Pa but, sorry, could I, could I just sure. finish my point? Uh, so the actual, the actual bumps on the paper are getting smoothened out. So, for example, if this is my, if this is my paper, and we apply a certain force downwards, as you say, s said, shouldn't the width of this actual decrease because of this pressure downwards? Uh, so, so yes, it will decrease, but mm. once again, it will reach a theoretical maximum, or mm. minimum rather, of the decrease, and right? Because this is only okay. uh, pressing down the bumps on the paper. Can you actually quantify this theoretical maximum? Uh, so we did test it uh, as shown by this diagram over here, and we do see that over time it approaches a value. Uh, I I think this is my this is my presentation, uh, and if I scroll up to where we did the qualitative analysis of the number of strokes, we see that it approaches a theoretical maximum around uh, a, a 90 uh, kilo ohms. Mm. So we so uh, okay. So we actually agree from this discussion point that the actual reason why the uh, the line is conductive is physically is because of the deposit of uh, the, the fractional loss of the surface roughness over over the number of lines drawn. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so then we can move on to a next second point of experimental improvements. So um, you mentioned in your in, uh, in your uh, you mentioned in your report that you varied the width and the width of the lines. Yes. And to do this, you sh sharpened uh, a piece uh, a sharp sharpened a, uh, a pencil tip, correct? Right. The pencil was sharpened to a fine point. Okay. So as you draw this pencil over the line, if s as we stated in our previous model that some of the pencils is sheared off, wouldn't the radius of this pencil gradually increase? Right, so the radius of the mm. pencil would gradually increase, but we kept it sharpened to a fine point at mm. all times. So uh, if you kept it sharpened to a fine point along the whole time, um, so after how, mu how much distance has been drawn, do you actually sharpen the, the pencil again? So because depending on what that is, your width will, uh, we actually disagree because the width will never be constant, no matter how, uh, how you actually try to sharpen the pencil. Because, because of this but fine- uh, But we measured the width and mm. we found it to be constant using our calipers. This was a thing that we um, How did you measure controlled. the width of this pencil? Not the width of the pencil, the width of the line created uh, on the paper. How did you measure the length of the line measured on, uh, on paper? We used calipers, we placed them over the line. How do you know your calipers it? are, ac uh, how do you know that the setup is accurate? Because your calipers me measure for, wh what is the uncertainty on your calipers? Uh, I believe it was uh, 0 0.001. What's the actual thickness of your line that you drew? The thickness of the, the, the line? Width, the width. The width of the line was around one millimeter. Uh, so that is 0 .001. Mm. Uh, centimeters, m sorry, millimeters, and so, yes. So we actually disagree. We think there's a lack of control in the actual width of line drawn, because even though with the caliber, because these differences due to this are, min uh, are small, so you would actually, 
see, you would actually see this from the, uh, you ac would actually see the increase in width over successful, successive pencil sharpenings. Would you agree? Uh, no, because okay, so when, you you when we this. applied the pencil okay. 50 times and then measured the width using the calipers, we ensured that the width was correct. And we know that it was correct to within one one thousandth at the very least, if not more of the actual width of the line, uh, which we believe to be a good enough uh, uh, precision okay. that we don't need to worry so about. So you mentioned how you drew 50 lines over your, your, paper, your piece of paper, right? Yeah. Did you actually control how much pressure was applied each time you draw the line? So we didn't control how much pressure was applied each time, and that is because it doesn't matter. Once again, we do reach a theoretical minimum of the resistance over time, and this is because we apply enough pressure that the grooves on the paper so get smoothed down. So as you stated before, and, uh, the exactly. pressure actually changes the roughness of the line by pressing down on the actual s the bumps of the line. Right. Why, why is it now that pressure does not matter? So, so over 50 strokes, applying sufficient pa uh, pressure, the, whole, the bumps of the paper will get completely smoothened down. So do you, you, do you think that 50 strokes is enough to actually s completely smooth yes, out the roughness of the paper? Yes, we do, because we saw Precise. our error bars become uh, about like 0.1 kilo ohm, which was really good considering that so the actual measurements were around 90 kilo ohms. If I actually applied, if I actually increase this pressure, would the number of lines it takes you to, re to reach the theoretical maximum decrease? Uh, yes, it would, but... Uh, Can you give a quali... Uh, is there, do you have a qualitative account or, or, or like a quantitative model of how the number of lines decreases? We with don't have a quantitative model of this, but it is unimportant to the problem at hand. Okay, so and we actually the effect think, would be small. we actually think the, since we agreed earlier, since the both reporter and uh, us, we were agreed that the most important parameter to the problem is the actual surface rough, uh, Sorry, roughness I other than the I geometry. Didn't, I didn't say that. Okay. Other than the geometry, okay. sure. Sure, other than the geometry, you, uh, we agreed uh, that the surface roughness. And ignoring the temperature. You think, uh, we think we think temperature is important because once again, uh, we did see quite a quite a variation uh, over our temperature. So we actually disagree. The, re the as we studied uh, stated before in our quantitative modeling, the reason why the pencil line is conductive is because the wells actually fill over the roughness of the paper and this thing becomes smooth. Do you agree? Yes, it does okay. become smooth. So if the roughness of the paper is very high, and your temperature. But is but that isn't that isn't. Uh, pertinent to our experimental setup. We used a standard piece of paper where the bumps aren't so extremely you exaggerated. Mentioned, uh, again, onto experimental setup. So we think that by, um, this, uh, by using a standard piece of paper, there's an overall lack of control on the surface roughness of the paper, which is one of the most important, f uh, which is the most important contributing parameter to this phenomenon. But, uh, but you don't, but, okay. but once again, we yeah. did test the number of strokes and we did see that our error bars shrunk uh, to an amount that was reasonable for us to use. Um, what were you, your error bars from? Uh, sorry, what? what so you, Our you error bars are yeah. the standard deviation over a sample size of five of the resistance of the line. Mm. Okay, so um, f perhaps uh, w we think that perhaps a more, uh, more experimentally controlled model for both your pressure and the surface roughness of the pencil line is for example to print a pencil holder or a graphite, uh, a graphite box where you can actually systematically vary the roughness of the paper, which as you said is very important to the, our problem to right, investigate the resistance gets, of the pencil line. Right, but so the problem statement says that it needs to be done on paper, not in a box, for example. It, we need mm. to deal with the interactions so between pencil and paper. So what is exactly this interaction between paper and pencil that is different from, from for example, a box? Uh, the difference is, from is a box is that structure? in a box, you have uh, the bumps in the box still being quite large. On a, whereas mm. on a piece of paper, over time, the bumps. So uh, we actually disagree. We small. think you can actually approximate the. We can. You can actually uh, b basically blow up this paper and have a graphite box but to control the actual surface. But it roughness says of the paper. paper. You can't so blow up the gaps because that isn't realistic for a piece of paper. Um, so I believe time is up. Okay. Uh, thank you, the reporter and the opponent, for your heated discussion. Uh, now you have one minute to conclude. Yes. Um, th uh, time is running. You can so, uh, <laughs> with the discussion with the reporter, we clear. We uh, with the discussion with the reporter, we cleared up cleared up several misconceptions about, for example, the the actual problem. So we uh, first uh, we, uh, with the reporter, we uh, we uh, concluded that the actual parameter of the surface of the box actually matters, and um, that it is actually an important contributing parameter to to this pro to this problem that the reporter has not systematically controlled and varied, or uh, as well as for example the uh, some other parameters they have not actually varied experimentally. So. Um,
perhaps as we suggested in the, exper uh, in the overview of, uh, in our discussion, to actually have some experimental improvements, for example, to var systematically vary the surface roughness of the pencil, or for example, to, s to uh, control the width of the pencil line in order to have more accurate measurements. And this, adjust this addresses the deviations in the report between uh, the th theoretical gra graphs and some, uh, in some of the theoretical graphs. And we also mentioned how there was an overall lack of systematic and quantitative investigation. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, Reviewer questions, please wear your mic. I see your mic is not, is on the table. Thank you. Okay, I, I will, okay, I'll go. Uh, turn it on, please. Uh, button at the top, yes. Test, 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 test one, there, two. Okay, you're yeah. good, okay. Uh, yep. So to the reporter, uh, how did you determine the 50 strokes again, like uh, to be the, like the max amount that you need? Uh, so you determined uh, 50 strokes to be that amount by uh, simply testing it for various strokes and noting that the error bars were reasonably small for 50 okay. strokes. And uh, to the reporter again, uh, why can you assume only uh, the percentage of graphite matters? And since there's a point where the graphite is still there, but it's uh, completely surrounded by non-conductive material, which you assumed was the, like the clay. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? So if if you have a percentage of graphite, which is to a certain point, it's going to be very low, and it's going to be fully surrounded by clay, which you assume to be non-conductive. How, how can you explain like this? Uh, the, the continued conductance yes. of the line? Uh, so basically, clay tends to be evenly distributed amongst the graphite because it acts as basically a binder. And so uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that such a situation would, occur, okay. would occur. Uh, how do you think the paper uh, that you found uh, found the values of uh, percentage for graphite? Sorry, what? So uh, the paper that you had, there was a table for, or like values for the percentage of graphite. Uh, Sorry, uh, the, the values for the percentage of graphite. Uh, according to the hardness. Were they were experimentally calculated. Okay, and uh, uh, did you us. use uh, like the same conditions to uh, like Sorry, calculate? Sorry, for temperature? No, for, for like the, okay, so moving on. Um, what would you expect the resistivity at uh, non-local higher temperatures to be? And this is directly to both? Uh, so, at, at, so what would I expect the, the temperature dependence of resistance to be at extremely yes. high temperatures? So uh, at temperatures beyond uh, 400 to 600 degrees Celsius, we would start to see it behave like a semiconductor in which resistance will actually increase with an increase in temperature. Okay. And uh, opponent, uh, do you agree with this? Um, I, we actually disagree with this because um, it, we see that as uh, from the graphite sheets, the graphite is uh, mainly a semiconductor throughout uh, the whole, uh, beyond a certain temperature. And we think that this temperature is not as high as 400 or 600 degrees. Okay, and um, how do you calculate the depth of the, uh, the line to for uh, the report? So uh, what we used in order to calculate the depth of the line was a scientific paper giving the uh, depth uh, that a standard piece of paper should have for the line. And is the paper that you used the same as the one found in the scientific paper? Yes, it is a standard piece of paper. Okay. Uh, Finally, uh, how did you make sure, like, how did you measure the resistance, at, like, with your test leads? How did you make sure that you had the test leads exactly at the end? Uh, so that was done manually, but it isn't too hard to notice. And any change with the test leads, any small amount of moving the test leads uh, away from the edges of the line would be easily noticeable uh, to the point where if it wasn't exactly at the edges of the line, the effect would be okay. negligible. Okay. Um, as well, uh, directed to both. As you rub the pencil on the paper, the tip sh changes shape. So, have you uh, taken like how do you take this into account? Uh, so, the way we did this was uh, we applied Kay. several strokes and then sharpened the pencil once again to ensure a fine point throughout the whole experiment. I believe we are out of time. Um, next, uh, two minutes for the prep of the reviewer. to get across certain things and then whose screen would they go on Uh, so this is the, uh, yeah, take this one. Can, oh. can you move your computer a bit closer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, click this 
swap. Um, the CMI. Uh, plenty of time. One minute. Yeah, one minute is a plenty of time. Is it working? Can you hear me? Okay. <coughs> Whenever you're re re okay. ready. All right. Okay. Uh, good evening, judges, and uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, I would like to go over the problem statement again, uh, and it is that a line drawn with a pencil on paper can be electrically conducting. Uh, we have to investigate the characteristics of the conducting line. So uh, what I'm going to do is going to give you uh, go through the tasks. So first of all, we're going to qu qualitatively explain the factors affecting the resistivity. Second of all, we're going to uh, anal uh, analyze the chemical makeup of uh, the task of analysis of a chemical makeup of lead. And then finally, there is the task of qualitative uh, model uh, predicting of resistivity. So. Uh, the summary of the report of the presenter, uh, uh, the reporter. Uh, first of all, the uh, there is a theoretical analysis of the microscopic analysis of the depositing of graphite. There is uh, then uh, the analysis of material composition as well as the impact of temperature. As well for the experimental confirmation, there was the uh, good. Uh, there was a good experimental setup and methods to adjust the temperature and height of the uh, the, the line. And uh, finally, as well as the determination of the graphite composition. Uh, composition. So the, for the merits of the reporter, uh, the m reporter uh, had a great uh, analysis of the microscopic interactions, as I said before. The, there's also a verification of the constants uh, using papers and uh, qualitative, uh, qualitative analysis of the relationships between parameters, and as well as their experimental ref verification of resistance versus the, m number, uh, the number of strokes on the paper. Uh, possible next steps to improve would be uh, they had a lack of quantitative predictions of resistance. There is a uh, uh, bad, like, uh, not well reliance on the constants derived from the literature uh, under different conditions. And uh, as well, there is a lack of uh, clarity regarding the changing of the width of the line. Uh, so uh, for example, were 50 strokes still used? Um, limited uh, experimental setup. So there is a limited control of uh, the surface. Uh, finally, there is a potential increased uh, uh, parameter investigation. So, uh, yeah, the, like for example, the type of paper. Uh, the summary of opposition. Uh, they gave a discussion on the height uh, the, for the discussion uh, on the height of the graphite on paper and errors in the depositing of graphite on paper. Uh, there was an interact. Uh, they talked about the interaction between graphite and paper. Uh, some merits uh, are the thorough analysis of potential improvements to the uh, experimental scope. Um, and as well as the analysis of pressure uh, and its impact on the, gra uh, the height of the graphite on paper. Uh, some possible next steps to be considered is the improved consideration of reporters' uh, qualitative uh, data for strokes, as well as uh, the incorrect as assumption that to use a container rather than paper, which is what is described by the problem statement. So uh, uh, for the discussion and analysis, uh, the points raised by the opponent uh, was that the surface roughness is constant regardless of the graphite deposited. And the re uh, reporter's response is that rough, uh, roughness of decreases with additional strokes. And I agree with the reporter. And this, and this, is, uh, this has p uh, literature uh, backup. And the roughness uh, is reduced with ad additional shear forces, as well as uh, uh, reduced graphite deposited with every stroke. Um, another point with the, in the analysis, uh, in the discussion, sorry, was that the reporter's uh, Opponent said that the reporter's experiments cannot be controlled due to uneven distribution of, of graphite for a given width. And the reporter's response was to use a caliper to determine the width of the line. I disagree with both reporter and um, uh, opponent. And I feel that I believe that a frame uh, around the shape, like a frame can be created with the shape of the line that needs to be drawn. And using the uh, reporter's theory that 50 strokes is enough, we can cover the, uh, the area within the frame to uh, correctly have uh, the right width and length of line. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you.
So now the reporter uh, concluding remarks you may start now. Um, so in our experiment, we varied four parameters. These were the length of the line, the width of the line, the hardness of the pencil, and the temperature of the line. And we believe that we provided a good theoretical explanation for the trends that we saw in all of these data sets, uh, including uh, using our theory in order to actually determine the graphite content of the pencil. Uh, we, we discussed why graphite behaves like a semiconductor at certain temperatures, uh, but we also discussed that the limitation would be in extremely high temperatures, how this might change. Uh, in terms of the application of pencil on paper, we believe that our use of the caliper actually did uh, control the width effectively, and our 50 strokes did smooth down the paper, uh, which actually allowed us to maintain a constant depth throughout our um, drawing. Uh, so by, we also believe that we varied the most important parameters, um, and that using a pencil on paper remained true to the problem statement at hand. So uh, overall, we believe that we did fulfill all of the tasks that the problem statement brought up, uh, qualitatively explaining uh, how the conductiveness of graphite works, uh, quantitatively describing the content of various pencils, and uh, theoretically describing the trend that we can see as we alter the dimensions and the temperature of the line. Uh, we also noted that in some situations, such as with our temperature, we were actually able to match up our experimentally defined constants with constants from literature. This shows that not only was our theory quite strong, but so was our experimental setup. Uh, and this is why we believe we have fulfilled all of the tasks uh, provided by the problem statement. Thank you. Thank you. So now, uh, reporter, opponent, reviewer, up for juror questions. Uh, is this going to work now? So, uh, or, uh, uh, probably no, still, still no. not work, but I'll leave okay. here. Okay. Uh, yeah, this way it's better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll talk in the uh, okay, so uh, first question, um, I guess this is really to everyone involved. There's a lot of discussion about the effect of pressure and smoothing over bite depth, but uh, I would ask is, do you think that the effect of doing multiple strokes has any other, uh, or the, the act of doing multiple strokes does it have any other effect on the experiment than smoothing things? Uh, perhaps I could begin. Uh, so one of the things that it does is in some cases there may be a certain bite groove on the paper, like especially right at the start when you've only applied maybe three or four strokes of graphite, there may be certain like bites in the paper that haven't been filled yet. And so uh, applying more strokes actually ensures that all of these bites are filled. And so we get like a clean line. Okay. Uh, does a do any of the other groups want to comment? <coughs> so Let's keep our answers short because we're running low on time, but just... So, um, we actually agree that the, the effect is mainly the smoothing out of the surface roughness. However, we also observe that by depending on how many times we draw a graphite on paper, the effect also causes the characters in our system. So because it changes the packing of our actual graph or it changes the packing of the actual graphite on paper as the area between them by uh, by drawing a line. So that's the uh, secondary uh, effect of the project having applied pressure on paper. Do you want to comment or uh, no? Uh, I was just I was just trying to get at that um, it might build up thickness of the graphite into the third dimension away from the paper, which would change the cross-sectional cross area of the resistance. Mm. But so well uh, we did note that paper can only hold graphite up until a certain thickness, so it would build it up to that thickness mm. and then not build it up any further. Right. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, hi, excellent presentations. Um, I wanted to ask, you talked about the limit in the high temperature uh, limit on the resistance. How do you think the system would behave as you get colder? So uh, as we get extremely cold, we know that particles begin to move slower and slower and eventually stop moving at absolute zero. And what this means is we would actually see an increase in resistance up until the point at absolute zero where the particles stop moving altogether and resistance should theoretically be infinite. Thank you. Is there a mic? I'll just steal this mic then. So I have a question for the uh, reporter. So you were saying that uh, graphite here behaves like a semi semiconductor yeah. because the dependence of the resistance on temperature is negative. Yeah. Right? Do you have an understanding of why temperature going up 
leads to resistance going down for semiconductor and the opposite uh, is true for metal? Yeah, one, once again, uh, there's actually the band gap that is bridged by electrons gaining energy in the valence band and jumping that band gap. And so the amount of electrons actually jumping into the conduction band uh, and basically meaning there are more electrons available to conduct electricity is what causes a decrease in resistance in a semiconductor. Meanwhile, in a conductor where all of the electrons are already free to move in the conductance band, increasing the temperature actually just causes the electrons to bang together, which increases resistance ex at, like expectedly. Good. Uh, and I have a question for the opponent. So you mentioned the effect of non-ohmic contacts. Yes. Um, so when do you expect that to be important? Like um, under which conditions? And when do you expect it to be not important? So we actually expect this to be fairly important under most conditions of laboratory testing. For example, um, in their model, like what do you think of? In lettuce. Due to the ro roughness of the paper, and uh, by uh, the transparency <laughs> actually causes there to be more or less lines drawn drawn in the paper, uh, and that's what the effect of the non-ohmic contact is. However, above a certain roughness where the actual graphite flows over flows over every hill in the pencil, the uh, effect of non-ohmic contact become becomes a lot uh, less. So at that point, it would be like uh, it would not actually ha have that much of an effect at the on the problem. Uh, so the reporter talked about how after a certain point, the lines, the number lines doesn't matter, and the opponent disagreed with that. Uh, my question is, say you have like an approximately infinite amount of lines on glossy paper versus standard paper. Do you think being on glossy paper would really change anything compared to the, pa the regular paper that you guys used? Uh, the f question for the reporter first and then the opponent. Mm. Uh, so I think, n notably, what, what's really holding graphite to the paper is the fact that paper is made of cellulose, which is, to put it simply, a bigger molecule than graphite, and so the London dispersion forces involved are actually greater with the cellulose on the paper than they are with the graphite, and so this is what allows the paper to hold the graphite. So I think, I think the biggest result of using glossy paper might be that it isn't pure cellulose, that it's been processed in some way, so that could potentially change how much it holds, and so uh, we might actually see a decrease in the amount of thickness of the lines, but um, I'd say because of that reason. We actually disagree agreed with this and we showed this in our, we actually showed this in our discussion that the primary driving mechanism of why graphite is, is deposited on paper is not due to the chemical composition for example cellulose but in fact because of the sheer stress that acts on the paper due to the roughness of the paper and so if we actually use for example a glossy piece of paper the sh sheer stress on the, uh, sh caused by that piece of paper with reduced surface roughness will be a lot less and this will cause less graphite to be deposited on the paper each time you rub uh, for example if you run the pencil over the piece of glossy paper. So across, for example, 50 lines, you might not actually reach a theoretical maximum for the smoothness of your pencil line. And so that would be the primary change caused by, for example, a glossy piece of paper. And we disagree with the reporter on that. If I may add, we did agree that it is both of these that do cause a result. But in the end, the amount of graphite that the paper can actually substantially hold attached to it uh, goes down. Thank you. Next question. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, for the opponent, please. Yep. Um, so it seems like in your model you change a lot of things and it specifically seems that you kept tons of things non-constant, right? Mm. So how does your result compare with their results? Um, so we actually do agree on certain results. For example, the uh, uh, the the uh, asymptotic value for the omic, uh, for for this the resistance to the length graph. But however, we also got a couple of other significant, uh, sorry, resistance to pressure graphs. However, we also were able to quantitatively predict the actual uh, resistance of the pencil line due to the, the parameters we varied. So pressure, length, uh, and as well as the roughness of the paper. Wait, but most of his results are experimental yep. results. Exactly. So mm. from his experimental results, yes. your model, which was more complicated, apparently predicted everything. Uh, Sorry? Is that right? Like most of his results are mm. experimental results. Yes. They didn't come from a model. So the question yes. is, does the result from your model quantitatively match those ones? Um, quantitatively, it doesn't exactly match those ones. 
because um, a lot of things were not controlled in the experiment, and we talked about this during our actual discussion. However, we think that a lot of the qualitative trends we're still able to see, because even though the f in their model this paper was like uh, was not controlled very well, the general trends of drawing might not be might not possess the same, for example, qualitative shape, but the overall negative or positive trend should still be preserved. So we, I think we agree on most of the positive and negative trends within this question. However, the exact quantitative model we think uh, is different from their model. Follow seat here. Hello. Hello? Can they hear here? Can the team hear here? Hello? Can the stream hear us? Okay, can the stream hear me now? No, this is not my eye. I switched it with Dave. I switched it with Dave's team. Hello? Yeah, okay. Do we have our score sheets set? So are all of the jurors done with the score sheets? Uh, I'm assuming yes. So let us announce the scores. The, uh, the score for the reporter on my left, it is 9, 9, 9, 10, 10, 10, 9, 9, 10, 9. For the opponent, six, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, seven, seven. And for the reviewer, we have five. Seven six seven eight eight nine nine ten nine. Thank you. So there is quite a discrepancy between uh, the grades given to the re reviewer. Could we have maybe uh, the highest mark, ten? Uh, give your re re reasons for why. Who gave a ten? Like anyone? Okay. So based on the criteria. Um, I just felt like they fulfilled all of the expectations. Um, so giving a concise and clear review of what the reporter and the opposition um, described and then analyzing the discussion, I felt like there was nothing missing from what they presented. Thank you. So uh, I think there was also a five given. Okay. Would you clarify? Um, to me, it seemed like the reporter kind of just read off the slides the whole time and uh, oh, I'm sorry, not the report, uh, the reviewer, and I, was, I wasn't c very convinced that there was a complete um, understanding of what was going on, and it also seemed like there was a bit of lack of presence in the discussion. Thank you. So that concludes our stage two of the COIPC 2020 finals. So uh, we'll give everyone, again, five minutes of break. Uh, we are almost ca catching up on our time, so uh, we'll see you guys back in five minutes. Thank you.
test, test. Yeah. Test, test, okay. Whenever he's back, to adjust the master of it. And it will, well, everyone heard me say that, but cool. <laughs> you know, behind the scenes right here. It is real life. It couldn't be more real than real. Got it? Say something? Ryan? Ryan? Say something? Okay. Yeah? No? Turn it on? Uh, it's on. Uh, what's the channel? 21. 21. Channel 21. Okay. Hello? Okay, so do we have all the teams back? Okay. So I think now we can begin. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Hello? Ryan, can I connect this HDMI to my computer? For the, uh, yeah. Wait, is the mic on? Yes. Okay. So, okay. so the mic is on, but um, it's just that it's only on for the stream. It's oh, only okay. on for the li live stream. So okay. if you might have to talk a little louder, um, if uh, people can't hear you, you can always talk in, into this. Okay. okay. You you have a clicker, right? Pardon? You have a clicker? Oh uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. So that is showing. Mm -hmm. So now we are ready to start. Start whenever you are ready. Okay. Uh, actually, no, I have to skip past all of these. <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Stone from Team Pentaquarks, and today I'll be presenting problem number three, Swing Sound Soup. So the problem statement asks us to study the characteristics of the sounds produced by corrugated plastic tubes as they are spun and how they are affected by relevant parameters. So for our parameters, we chose to vary the length of the tube, the corrugation distance, the speed at which the tube rotates, and the airflow through the food. So here's an overview of what I'll be covering for today. So first, I'll start with the reproduction of our phenomenon, then I'll move on to our experimental setup, then followed by our theoretical model, key parameters, and finally, our conclusion. So for our phenomenon, as the problem statement states, we have a corrugated plastic tube, which is spun by a motor and a belt. So, um, you will be, as the two speed up, you will be able to hear different harmonics. However, um, I believe the sound is quite quiet on the computer. So moving on to our experimental setup. So here we have our corrugated plastic tube and our counterweight in order to keep the center of mass of our rotating system on the axis of rotation. We also have our stationary microphone also on the axis of rotation to counteract any possible Doppler effects. We also have our Arduino uh, here to relay code to our stepper motor as well as our 3D printed gearbox. This together allows for high control over our angular frequency. Now, um, to measure the peak frequency of our sound, we use the fast Fourier transform on Audacity, and when converted to the power level, we can see a distinct peak frequency. This allows for a very precise method to measure our peak frequency. Now, for the dimensions of our tube, we used a measuring tape to measure the length of the tube, and a caliber to measure the diameter and the thickness of the tube. For the uh, for the dimensions of our corrugations, we once again use the caliber to measure the height, width, and volume of our corrugation. To calculate the volume of our corrugation, we approximated our corrugation as a semi-elliptical torus, given as such. Now moving on to our theoretical model, first I will begin with a qualitative account as to how our phenomenon occurs, then I will move on to quantitatively explain how uh, frequency varies with axial flow velocity, and then how to predict axial flow velocity with a given angular velocity. Now looking at the, uh, a constant airflow throughout our corrugated pipe, we can see an uh, air velocity profile as such. And as this air moves across the corrugations, uh, we can see that um, there's a certain no-slip boundary condition between the oncoming airflow and the uh, outer edge of the tube. However, as the air moves across the corrugations, there's no longer such boundary. Now according to Bernoulli's principle, uh, since the oncoming airflow has a higher velocity, its th uh, pressure is thus lower than the air within the corrugation. This thus allows for the air within the corrugations to move outwards and onto the oncoming flow. However, some air hits the corner of the corrugation, and this is known as impinging shear layer instability. This allows for some air to move onwards and onto the flow, while some of the air travels back down into the corrugation. This thus forms tiny vortices within our corrugations, and as the uh, oncoming airflow speeds up, so does the uh, velocity of our vortex. 
due to the uh, serious stress that the oncoming airflow is applying onto your, uh, uh, on your, onto your vortices. Now, uh, these vortices must exist in order for harmonics to be audible. This implies that there, is, uh, there must be turbulence within the corrugations, uh, uh, which means the Reynolds number must exceed that of 2,300. Now, it is also important to note that um, the uh, heard uh, frequency is amplified when the frequency of the vortex matches that of the excitation frequency of our tube. This thus means there's resonance within our system between the frequency vortex, a frequency, a vort a frequency of the vortex, and the excitation frequency of the tube. Now, moving on to our second theoretical model, tube resonance. So, taking a look at the geometry of the tube, we can see as the follows. However, since we are taking into account the acoustics of our tube, we must take into account the end correction. Uh, this is due to a tiny part of the waveline poking out of the tube. Now, to model uh, the flow through our uh, corrugated tube, we use the following Euler equation, where C represents the speed of sound, P represents the pressure, and U bar and V bar represent the uh, space, aver space average axial and radial velocity, uh, respectively. However, this equation is difficult to compute numerically, thus we resor resort to an uh, analytical method of, um, uh, of a formula from literature. So um, looking at this formula, we can see that there's effective speed of sound. This is due to the uh, introduction of corrugations within our system. And this term here represents the ratio of the corrugation volume to the volume of our tube. As this term increases, or as the volume of the corrugations increase, uh, the speed of the airflow is more in, uh, impeded due to the uh, larger corrugations, and this thus results in a lower effective speed of sound. Now this brings us to our final e equation for the natural frequencies of a corrugated pipe. However, this, uh, even though this, uh, this formula allows us to predict how natural frequencies, uh, the natural frequencies of a corrugated pipe, it does not allow us to predict how these frequencies vary with, with axial flow velocity. This brings us to our Struhaus number. So our Struhaus number represents the ratio of the frequent, uh, uh, velocity of our vortex, or the instability of our flow, to the mean fluid velocity through the tube, or the predictability of the flow. This can also be expressed as such, with f being the frequency and d being the corrugation distance. For our Searles number, we achieve a, a value of 0 0.4, which is taken from literature. And to experimentally uh, uh, verify our theoretical, we use the following blowing setup. Here we have a corrugated pipe with our fans attached by a connector piece, which keeps the distance between the fans and the corrugated pipe constant. Now, uh, plotting, uh, Axial flow velocity against uh, our frequency, we can see that our, ex our experimental data does indeed have a good uh, agreement with that of our theoretical. We can also see that there is actually a minimum audible frequency as he uh, shown here. This is indeed due to the threshold axial flow velocity needed to, uh, for turbulence within the corrugations, represented by the following formula, where RE represents the minimum Reynolds number needed for turbulence within our corrugations, or 2,300. This brings us to our threshold axial flow velocity of around 7.11 meters per second. However, we can also see here that two frequencies are heard at the exact same time. This is due to the transitional phase between frequencies. So here on the power level spectrum, we can see two distinct peak frequencies heard of a very similar power level. This is the combination of the second harmonic and the third harmonic. It is uh, also seen that the uh, power level of these, uh, this transitional phase is much lower than that of the steady phase of the respective harmonics. This is due to the fact that in the transitional phase, the frequency of the vortex does not match up with that with the excitation frequency of the tube. This means there is um, less resonance and thus uh, the uh, produced power level is much quieter. Now moving on to our, uh, to our third theoretical model, fluid dynamics. So looking at the geometry of our corrugated pipe, uh, we have our, our tube rotating around an axis of rotation with a certain rotational radius, which is equal to the length of the tube. We also have U bar representing the axial flow velocity, and with omega representing the angular velocity, and U T representing the tangential velocity, which can, which can be also expressed as such. Now, for the flow of throughout, uh, throughout our tube, we are assuming that the velocity profile stays relatively constant, and due to the small difference between the density of the air at the rotating end of the tube and the density of the air at the stationary end of the tube, we can therefore neglect any fluctuations with, of density. Now here, we, uh, we can see that with, within our rotating tube, there's a, there's a certain centripetal force enacting on any cross-sectional air within our tube of width dx. 
And this is due to a pressure difference of the pressure and acting uh, from the left-hand side of Px and the right-hand side, which is Px plus dx. Now this brings us to the following equation and integrating this for uh, the pressure difference, we can achieve the final formula for the axial flow velocity as u equals uh, omega L. However, this does not account for a uh, friction within our system. This thus brings us to our uh, next equation, which includes the Darcy friction factor. This term here is the Darcy, uh, Darcy wasteback, equa uh, wasteback equation, which uh, accounts for uh, the flow as it moves through the tube, uh, which a certain friction on the uh, outer perimeter of our tube. Uh, CF here represents the friction factor. However, um, this is unknown. Uh, but when comparing uh, the uh, measurements of the parameters of R2 to that of literature, we can see that there is uh, pretty uh, good similarities. Thus, we can therefore approximate their friction factor of 0 0.0178 as our own. This brings us to our final equation for, uh, 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 for axial flow velocity based on angular velocity. So when graphing, uh, when plotting uh, angular velocity against frequency, we can once again see that our theoretical, uh, our theoretical matches quite well with that of our experimental data. Now moving on to key parameters, um, when plotting uh, the tube length against that of frequency, we can see that as we cut down our tube length, uh, we achieved uh, uh, higher and higher frequencies, and we can see that our, ex our experimental data agrees quite well with that of our theoretical as well. This is due to the fact that um, as the uh, length decreases, uh, it has an inverse it is inverse inversely proportional to that frequency, so thus frequency increases as well. Now, um, when plotting uh, corrugation distance against frequency, we can see that uh, higher frequencies are achieved with uh, larger co uh, distances between corrugations, and this is due to the fact that as the distance between corrugations increase, our tube more and more resembles that of a perfectly smooth tube, which, um, which means our um, graph your asymptotes towards a certain value, which is the uh, frequency of a perfectly smooth tube of the same length. However, due to limited access to different tubes, uh, we were not able to experimentally verify our theoretical. Now, in summary, we can see that our axial flow velocity and, the, and our angular uh, rotational frequency has a positive correlation with that of the mode number or the frequency achieved, and that our tube length has a negative correlation and our corrugation distance has a positive correlation with that of our natural harmonic frequencies. Now taking a further uh, look into our uh, setup, uh, we, uh, we also now uh, analyze the effects of bending. And we can see that uh, at bending at, uh, rotating at different rotational uh, frequencies, we can see that uh, different rotational radius can be achieved due to the effects of bending on our tube. However, even with bending and the varied rotational radius, we were still able to accurately predict the frequencies uh, produced by our tube. So in conclusion, we started with a controlled experiment, ex experimental setup using audacity, audacity to actu accurately measure our peak frequency. Then we moved on to our theoretical model with, uh, by qualitatively explaining our phenomenon and how it occurs. And then we quantitatively explain how uh, frequency varies with that of axial flow velocity and how axial flow velocity varies with angular uh, velocity. Finally, by varying our key parameters, our tube length and our corrugation distance, we can uh, we, uh, we uh, experimentally verified our theoreticals to show a good fit. Here are my references, and thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Two minutes for the opponent's question. Opponent? Microphone, please. Thank you. No. Let's have our microphones and things prepared before we, <coughs> we speak. We can hear you. Uh, yeah, my first question is, how would you determine the Struhl number b uh, by yourself rather than relying on a paper? Uh, it will be quite complicated, so that's we resorted to uh, using the Struhl numbers which we derive from literature. And we can see that when uh, graphing our theoretical data against that of the, th uh, uh, graphing our experimental data against the theoretical which we uh, attained using the Strauss number, we can see a good fit. Okay, how did you change your corrugation distance? Uh, like, as I said earlier, we were, uh, due to limited access to tubes of the exact same parameters except corrugation distance, for example, keeping uh, diameter constant and material constant, it was difficult to find another tube of th uh, different corrugation distance with all the separate parameters constant. However, we were, we were able to come up with a theoretical to uh, model what would happen if we 
uh, were to change the corrugation distance, and we can see that with larger corrug corrugation distances, we achieve higher natural harmonics due to uh, the fact that with larger corrugation distances, our tube more and more resembles that of a perfectly smooth tube. Okay, uh, how would a change in temperature change the frequency heard? How would a change in temperature change the frequency? Yeah. So um, a change in temperature will not uh, directly change the uh, frequency produced. However, uh, a change in temperature does indeed impact the uh, uh, speed of sound. So for example, with higher uh, temperatures, it's a higher speed of sound, which thus then um, increases the natural uh, harmonics produced by the tube. However, since we kept our temperature constant at room temperature, there is not a, a much uh, uh, deviation in the frequency produced. Thank you. So now preparation of the opponent, three minutes. Microphone. Okay. Uh, whenever you're re ready. This is Mike. All right, we should start about now. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Momin Khan, and uh, today I will be opposing the change in sound tube. Uh, the uh, point given by Adam was a sound tube is a toy consisting of a corrugated plastic tube that you can spin around to produce sounds. Study the characteristics of the sound produced by the such toys and how they are affected by the relevant parameters. Um, yeah, so the tasks uh, shown in this problem uh, uh, were uh, creation of controlled experimental setup. Uh, task two was quantitative analysis of parameters impacting frequency. And task three would be uh, confirmation of experimental findings. So a summary of the pro uh, report uh, was uh, the, uh, an experimental setup, uh, their experimental setup, and a determination of the frequency emitted. Uh, an al an an Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, experimental setup and determination of the frequency emitted, an analysis of two frequency and fluid dynamics, and a confirmation of the key parameters. So some merits and next steps are shown in their uh, uh, presentation. Uh, merits would be uh, there was a very effective measurement of the harmonic frequency given. 
Um, uh, number two was there was a very in-depth analysis of the effect of the corrugations on frequency emitted. Uh, and number three was that there was a very strong theoretical model with some experimental verification. Uh, some possible next steps to be taken is uh, a determination of constants experimentally rather than uh, completely theoretically, uh, such as the stroll number and the friction factor. Uh, number two would be an impact of the bending of the tube on experimental findings. Um, number three would be potential error in vari uh, varying tube length. Uh, and number four would be lacking experimental verification of corrugation distance. At this point, I would like to um, ask the reporter to come on stage. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, first I would like to, is everything okay? Oh yeah, okay. So, sorry. How would uh, allowing the tube to bend change the frequency? How would allowing the tube cha uh, allow to cha bend change the frequency? Yeah. As in the natural frequencies of the pipe? Uh, uh, the the uh, uh, frequency emitted. Frequency emitted. Well, uh, allowing the tube to bend would thus change the rotational radius of the tube, which thus, um, uh, the decrease in rotational radius is that there is a decrease in the axial flow velocity, thus allowing for um, lower frequencies to be uh, emitted. Uh, okay. Um, how did, uh, sorry, uh, how would using different gases affect the uh, frequencies heard? Uh, uh, using different not, not the fundamental frequency. Uh, different gases. Yeah. Uh, would you like to provide an example? Uh, if you were to use a, an, a, a gas with a, a higher of, uh, coefficient of friction. Uh, I wouldn't know one off the top of my head. With a higher coefficient of friction. Yeah. So you're saying um, as uh, with the separate gas, so as the air goes th uh, w it moves throughout the tube, mm -hmm. there is a higher friction with uh, friction. Mm -hmm. So um, if there's a higher uh, friction within our tube, as you can see here, with the lower friction factors, higher actual of flow, of flow velocity will be achieved. This allows for um, uh, higher frequencies to be heard uh, as well as uh, since it allows for a higher axial flow velocity, um, this allows for a more, um, more of the natural frequencies to be heard, I guess. OK. Uh, how would a change in temperature change the frequency uh, heard? How uh, would a change in temperature? Yeah. So um, as I said previously, with a uh, higher uh, temperature, uh, uh, with a higher uh, t temperature, uh, more a higher speed of sound would be achieved. And this, this thus increases the natural frequencies of the pipe. OK. Uh, some uh, variables uh, I think could be looked into uh, when it comes to this um, setup is, um, sorry, uh, the material of the tube itself, uh, rather than just using a plastic tube, maybe a metal tube. How, mm -hmm. would, how do you think using a metal tube would affect the frequencies heard? Using a metal tube? Yeah. Well, once again, with the metal tube, there will be varying uh, 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 coefficients of friction. This thus uh, allows for, um, with the metal tube, there uh, would most likely be a lower friction factor as it was smoother, which allows for an axial flow velocity, higher axial flow velocity throughout the tube. Okay. Um, and the, another variable to change uh, could be outside frequencies on the tube and how it would affect the sound emitted. Because, of course, when we are going to be whirling these sound tubes around, uh, we wouldn't be in a completely soundless room. There would be outside frequencies. Um, a, a possible variable that you could look into is how that would affect the uh, frequency emitted. Yes. Um, so... Um, uh, so you're saying that um, possible outside disturbances could affect the frequencies that we hear? Yeah. Well, here um, we can see that when uh, in our fast Fourier transform that we used on Audacity, when converted to the power level, we see a distinct peak frequency emitted by our tube, which thus allows for a precise method to measure a peak frequency. Okay. Um, how did you come up with that, uh, uh, the uh, error? The error? Pl yeah, plus or minus Well, the error was dependent on the bin size that we used for our uh, our, our fast Fourier transform on Audacity. So with larger uh, uh, bin sizes, we just have smaller errors. Okay. Uh, what were uh, the, uh, how did you um, uh, mitigate the effect of outside wind on uh, your uh, experimental setup? So are you saying outside wind, uh, uh, how it impacts the flow through the tube? Yeah. Oh, well, how, how would outside wind affect uh, the frequency emitted by the tube? Well, um, for example, uh, for a setup where we, uh, only measure the axial flow velocity through our tube. Our fan was rather close to our, the opening of our corrugated pipe. This, uh, thus, uh, this thus means any outside wind is thus ne negligible. Okay. 
Uh, and uh, the uh, um, sorry, how did you mitigate the Doppler's effect? Uh, Doppler's effect. Yeah. Yes, I see. So, so uh, in our experimental setup, our stationary microphone is stationed right at the axis of rotation. This means that uh, the distance between the rotating end of the tube and the stationary microphone I is constant throughout the entire uh, cycle. This thus means there is no Doppler effect present in our uh, with with our stationary microphone setup. Okay. Um, sorry. How would uh, covering the tube with uh, how would uh, rigid how does rigidity uh, change the frequency emitted by the tube? Rigidity. Yeah, rigidity of the tube itself. Like the natural frequencies? Uh, yeah. Rigidity itself will not impact the natural frequencies of the tube, as that only the as the natural frequency of the tube is uh, only dependent on the length and the, the mode number and the effective speed of sound. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, would, uh, do you, what do you think the fundamental frequency of the tube would be if there was no corrugations? If there was no corrugations. The fundamental frequency of the tube would, um, uh, because of no corrugation, the effective speed of sound would thus uh, be irrelevant. So with, um, with a lower effective speed of sound uh, or with a completely smooth, perfect tube, our natural frequencies would thus increase. Or oh. with a higher speed of sound, sorry. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, there was just uh, something, uh, you said that you were unable to change the uh, diameter of the tube itself. The diameter of the tube itself. Diameter of the tube itself. Um, mm -hmm. The way we were able to do it was we were able to fill the corrugations with, a, um, with clay, mm -hmm. uh, which would decrease the corrugation uh, depth itself. Uh, what do you think the effect of a smaller diameter of the corrugations would have on the frequency emitted by the tube? A smaller diameter of the corrugation? Mm -hmm. Well, the diameter of the corrugation itself would not impact the uh, natural frequencies of the tube. However, this would impact how the sound is heard. However, this, uh, that, that is um, quite uh, hard to measure as power level can be quite um, uh, difficult to de determine as there is indeed a turbulent flow within our corrugated pipe. How would uh, it change in the, uh, how would it change how we hear the frequency? How we hear the frequency? Yeah. Well, um, so the diameter uh, uh, of, uh, so you're saying when you uh, use clay, you also uh, cover the corrugations with us, uh, alters the corrugation itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the corrugation is um, altered with a uh, smaller length and width, I assume, uh, which we're covering it with clay, this thus in, uh, impacts the volume of our corrugation shown here. So with an increase in the volume of our, or with a decrease in the volume of corrugation, there's thus an increased effective speed of sound, which thus increases our natural frequencies heard. Okay. Mm. I think that's it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I uh, just, um, in conclusion, uh, wait, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm done. Yeah. Oh, you're done, so yeah. it is, you're concluding? Yeah. Uh, state? Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so just uh, in conclusion, uh, we believe that an experimental determination of key constants would help make your data more uh, reliable instead of just uh, relying on a paper. Um, this would allow you to use it more effectively. Uh, and uh, perhaps looking into uh, varying the key parameters a bit more, such as the diameter, would allow you to uh, f more fully understand the phenomenon. Um, and uh, variation of the key parameter, uh, more variation of the key parameters would allow you to, uh, to um, uh, uh, show the phenomenon a, a bit better and more in depth. Thank you. Thank you. So now we move on to three minutes of questioning by the reviewer. So thank you to both for the presentation and discussion. First off, to both of you, were you able to ever hear the fundamental frequency? Uh, personally, no, we were not able to hear the fundamental frequency as the length of our tube was uh, too long. And, uh, so here we can see that the length it's directly- It's just a yes or no, sorry, uh, uh, no. to the opponent. Uh, when we heard it, it was extremely low. It was a very low roaring sound. Okay, and to the reporter, what impacts would bending in the tube actually have on the sound produced? On the actual sound produced? Yes. Uh, as uh, there would, uh, bending in the tube would not have any direct on the natural frequencies of the tube. As we can see here, that only length, effective, effective speed of sound, and uh, mode number have it, has and an effect. how did you account for these like, actual effects in the theoretical model? How did you get those calculated values that you presented? The calculated values of... Just for the frequency. For the frequency. Okay, so 
the only things that you are, like it seems that the only things you accounted for were the change in length and the rotation radius. Is this all you considered as changing? Uh, for, uh, when it's bent. When it's, when it's bent. Is that the only thing that changes, the length and the rotation radius? Is that the only difference? Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay, and to the opponent, did you consider any end corrections for your tube when calculating your frequencies? We did look into uh, varying the end of the tube using a the bell. End correction. Or a what? As in the sound resonates even beyond the length of the tube. Did you consider this? Did you have a correction factor? No, we did not. And for the reporter, did you have it? Uh, yes, we did. As and to the opponent, oh. or actually both of you, do you think there would be an effect of having a flanged end to your sound tube? Like most of them have a, one of the ends kind of flanging outwards. Do you think this would have an actual effect on the sound produced? Uh, uh, no, it would not as if it, uh, the flange end is only so that more air can enter the pipe, which thus increases. Do you not think this would actually have an uh, effect on your end correction? Uh, for an end correction of our corridor pipe? It actually changes as if you have a flange end. So I'll move on. Um, how do you think, to the reporter, how do you think the sound would change as the height of the corrugations increases? As the height of the corrugations increase. As the height of the corrugations increase, this thus um, increases the volume of the corrugation. Which, uh, with an increase in volume, this thus decreases the effective speed of sound, which okay. thus decreases the natural frequencies. And to both, is there a limit to the ratio of length to width of the tube that actually allows you to hear a sound? I'll start with the opponent. Uh, uh, theoretically, uh, we found no, uh, because, uh, but experimentally, yes, because there was a, uh, there was a limit to our experimental And the setup. reporter? Uh, the length and the width of the tube? Uh, uh, the ratio, as in if I get a very short tube, would you still get a sound? Uh, there, uh, with certain extremities, uh, uh, no, uh, as in if the tube gets short enough so that um, no air can ever bump into the corrugations, there is no sound. Okay, and also, did you analyze to the reporter, did you analyze the sound on both ends of the tube or just the inside? Uh, we, uh, so in our experimental setup, we stationed our microphone so that it was right Wait, on the- Would there be a difference between inside and outside? We are out of Inside time. and outside? If you put the microphone inside- Wait, we, we are out of time, time. thank oh. you. Okay, so uh, two minutes of prep of the reviewer. Okay, what else? Uh, wait for the
to look at the effects of the corrugation on the sound production. The third task that we identified is qualitatively and quantitatively explaining the phenomena. And task four is designing a controlled and effective experimental setup. And task five is variation in the key parameters and <laughs> comparing it with the theoretical model presented. So just a summary of the report. They started off with qualitative descriptions of the phenomenon. Then they moved on into a description of the tube resonance. And they moved on into an analysis of fluid dynamics. In terms of experimental confirmation, they started off with the corrugation effects and they looked into that. Then they analyzed the natural frequencies before finally looking at just general frequency and the axial flow velocity. So in terms of the reporter, some merits of the presentation were first is that they presented a very good controlled experimental setup where they were able to vary parameters very nicely. The second one is that through the theory, they had a thorough theoretical model and phenomenon explanation. And then lastly, they had uh, effective responses in the discussion to the points brought up by the opponent. In terms of some possible next steps, they should really be analyzing the theoretical limits and at what point their theory actually no longer applies. Next is further experimentation and variation parameters. For example, the radius of the tube, perhaps a flanged end, which is something they did not consider. Next is an experimental verification of theoretical models. This was especially lacking in the distance between corrugations, and they did not actually present any analysis or comparison between experimental and theoretical results. In addition, in terms of bending of the tube, they only really looked at the difference in the rotational radius and the length of the tube, but in reality, there are still other factors that uh, like are different when you have a bent tube. In addition, some error, uh, like analysis of errors and the deviations. Um, and they didn't really explain how they determined their constant factors. So in terms of the opposition, some key insights, they, talk, they brought up things about the experimental determination of those key constants. They also looked at the effects of bending on the uh, tube acoustics, uh, as well as the lack of experimental ver verification for various models, namely the distance between the corrugations. And additional variation of background parameters, namely the radius of the tube. So uh, some merits of the opponent, again, uh, they talked about parameter variation and pointed out some experimental errors. So possible next steps, uh, more analysis on corrugations, also uh, focus on theoretical limits and experimental limitations. As I mentioned, this was not uh, discussed in depth. And also, they should have focused a little bit more on what the reporter presented instead of just bringing up what were sometimes unrelated points. And they spent a little bit too much time on the talk about friction. Uh, and there's also a lack of focus on the experimental setups and some of the issues there. So in terms of the discussion, the first point brought up was the parameter variation. So the point raised by the opponent um, was talking about the uh, corrugation diameter. So the reporter's response was that the diameter of the corrugation does not actually affect the natural frequencies of the tube. Uh, we actually uh, agree with the opponent in this, and that varying the diameter of the corrugations of the tube should actually change the frequency uh, emitted by the tube. Uh, the next discussion point was the Doppler effect. So the opponent raised the point of how did you account for the Doppler effect? And the reporter uh, responded that the microphone was placed at the base of the axis of rotation in order to minimize the Doppler effect. And in this case, we agree with the reporter that although the Doppler effect should be accounted for, they did this very accurately and ensured that it did not play an impact. Uh, and then the last point was fluid friction, where the opponent talked about how fluid friction might affect the motion. Uh, the reporter's response was like negligible. And we kind of agree with both. There is a slight impact, but it's not the most major part of the problem. In terms of some just quick overall general uh, suggestions, the flanged end is a very important thing to keep in mind because uh, many sound tubes do have a flanged end and this will actually change your end correction factor. So actually get an, a correction factor about 1.43 times the radius instead of 1.22. So they should have actually focused on that. As well as the bending effect, there were some effects of that that were not actually considered. As well as there was no real governing equation uh, that for their theory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you to both the opponent and the reviewer. So just to clarify some things, um, wait, is the, oh, yes, yeah, so, um, so uh, we're measuring the CL for the friction factor. This can be measured by uh, measuring a pressure drop at the end of the tube. However, um, due to time constraints, we're not able to uh, measure the CL friction factor. And also for the Doppler effect, uh, this was brought up by uh, the reviewer. However, we were able to neglect the Doppler effect as we station our stationary microphone on the axis of rotation. Also, we'll change the diameter of tube. Uh, I, uh, I, realize, uh, I know that increasing volume of the corrugation due to uh, a varied diameter does impact the effective speed of sound, as with higher uh, corrugation volume, there is thus a lower effective speed of sound, which thus uh, lowers the natural frequencies of the pipe. For effects of bite bending, it changes the rotational radius, uh, while the length of the tube itself stays constant, as we can see here. 
So with uh, uh, bending, uh, rotating our tube at different uh, angular velocities while allow allowing it to bend, so, uh, this indeed uh, vary its uh, rotational radius. However, we were still able to accurately predict our, uh, natural, fre our natural frequencies of our tube. Now moving on to bending, uh, we attempted to predict the bending of our tube using uh, Euler-Bernoulli beam theory. Uh, however, um, uh, look, when looking at our plot, we can see that um, there is a large deviation in the curvature of our tube. How, so this does not uh, uh, allow us to actually predict, predict the bending. So in conclusion, we started with an, a controlled experimental setup with a stationary microphone on the axis of rotation to counteract any possible Doppler effects. Then we moved on to our theoretical model to qual qualitatively explain our phenomenon and quantitatively uh, analyze how frequency varies with axial velocity and flow velocity. And finally, we buried our key parameters, including um, tube length and corrugation distance, and with experimental data to show a good fit. And thank you for listening. Great, great uh, presentations all around. Uh, so I have, first question I have is for uh, the reporters. Uh, on your slide where you looked at the bending of the tube, one thing I noticed is that it seems to be nonlinear in uh, the speed. So you're going from 12, 18, 24, and I th if I remember correctly, you had what, like 0.87 for 12? Oh yes. Or uh, 89, I was close. So can you comment a bit on, on why it is that you're seeing this uh, so this increase in length and then a decrease in length, it seems a bit. Oh yes, so, um, when we spun our tube, uh, we have, we, uh, this is our axis of rotation with our spinning setup as such, and we attached our, um, uh, uh, our tube so it was perpendicular to that of um, our rotating setup. However, due to the uh, different uh, velo uh, angular uh, velocities having effect on how the tube is spun around the actual uh, system, it uh, tends to lag behind and thus um, alter the rotation, rotational radius. So it's bending in two directions at the same time, right? Yes. Okay, so that's why you'd see that. Okay, great. Uh, second question is for the reviewer. You mentioned that the effect of bending, uh, that you, you felt it was insufficient to only model it as a change of uh, the velocity and the length of the tube. You mentioned that there's other things you think are affected. Can you talk briefly well, on what those other factors are? Yeah, so I would say firstly, the airflow is not really fully axial anymore. And then you also have the airflow interacting slightly differently with the actual like corrugation. So you get like a different Reynolds number in the corrugations, the turbulence would be different. And I think that would actually affect the actual sound produced. And I think they talk about like o Euler Bernoulli beam theory, which I'm not sure is really applicable in this case, because that usually I think only applies to like rigid bodies, which I'm not sure this can really be applied here, but there were just some factors that they even just qualitatively did not talk about. Thank you. So I just, I just have a quick question uh, you, for the reporter. You mentioned um, an equation that was difficult to solve numerically. I was uh, wondering if you could uh, give some specifics on uh, why this is difficult to solve numerically and why you didn't. Because um, this equation was quite, quite complex as it accounted for t uh, two spaced average velocities, which is the axial velocity represented by U bar and the uh, radial velocity represented by V bar. Uh, I have a question for the reporter. You mentioned, I think, that you use a non-slip boundary condition when you're considering the vortices, but then you also mentioned that you use a uniform flow profile throughout the tube. So um, these assumptions kind of contradict each other. So could you maybe comment on how, uh, how your analysis is impacted by um, deviations from these assumptions? So um, uh, for the most part, as our air moves throughout our tube, the no-slip boundary condition uh, keeps the air at the very edge, uh, stationary. Uh, although the corrugation uh, do indeed uh, allow for some of the air to move into the corrugation, thus uh, slightly altering the velocity profile, um, overall the velocity profile through our two stays relatively constant. Constant. What do you mean by constant? Like, uh, do you mean that it's the same velocity at all areas in the tube except for in the corrugation? Uh, the velocity? Um, uh, well, the incoming velocity and the outgoing uh, and the velocity coming out the other end is uh, equal to each other. Okay, but is it constant as a function of radius within the tube? Uh, the velocity of the airflow is it constant uh, according to the radius uh, certain point on the tube? Um, it was quite difficult to difficult to actually measure the velocity uh, profile throughout our tube, 
due to the high turbulence. However, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the average velocity throughout the tube it stays relatively constant. Yeah, so I have a question for the reporter. Oh, um, sorry. Um, so you, the, just generally, the, the plots that you were showing seemed like they um, were pretty continuous. And uh, I mean, for example, the frequency, the power spectrum was like just one peak and there was no noise whatsoever, like except for this one, like the, the, the following ones. Can you comment on how you got those uh, plots? So we converted this to uh, the power spectrum, which is like an yeah, uh, this one, for example. Like, pardon? for example, what are the, how is, why is this, uh, y axis like 10 to the 89, and why is there nothing else except then at 624? Uh, it's an arbitrary unit to um, highlight uh, the peak frequency that we heard, which is uh, much louder than the other peak frequencies that we can see on this graph. So how did you get that? How do we get to here? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, so. Uh, what we did was we uh, took uh, the values of uh, all of the power levels here, and um, we averaged them, and uh, we multiplied them exponentially so that we can highlight our peak frequency. Sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry. Could you repeat that? Oh, okay. Uh, so we, so we took all of the uh, values that we have on our uh, plot here, mm -hmm. and then we converted to um, uh, our decibels to power level, which is... Um, uh, which tends to the power, so thus we can uh, highlight our peak frequency as such. Okay. Um, just a question for the reviewer. Uh, you guys um, mentioned that, um, I don't know if it was a reporter or the opponent spent too much time talking about friction. Um, does that mean you think it's not important? And if, if so, could you explain why? No, I think it, it, it is important. It's just, the, this is something that I would say, like, it should have been brought up, but it's something that they do, uh, the, reporters did not really talk about in their model. So they, I feel like they spent a little bit too much time like, like on that topic when it was more like, yeah, like uh, obviously I do think it's important. I just thought, yeah. There were like other topics I thought could have also been covered in the discussion that were like instead. Okay, yeah, thank you. So uh, that concludes the uh, third stage of the finals. <laughs> I am, uh, I am pleased to announce that we are like on time again. So uh, just give us a few, uh, so, just, so just give us a bit of time, we will compute the scores, and then uh, we will move on to our award ceremonies. Thank you. here as well, I guess. Okay, so for the reporter from my left, it is eight, five, eight, eight, nine, eight, nine, ten, ten, eight. Okay. Good. Okay. For the opponent, we have eight, eight, Seven, seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, eight, eight. And for the reviewer, Ooh. holy smokes, nine, eight, ten, eight, ten, 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 ten. ten. Okay, very nice. So. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll move on with the justification a little bit too, because there's a quite a large discrepancy with the uh, reporter. So for the reporter, uh, I think the lowest was a five. Uh, can you comment on that a little bit? Which 
after I talk just here, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I'm not totally convinced that the report has like not necessarily a quantitative understanding, but a qualitative understanding of what's going on. Because, so for example, he got asked. Well, he got asked by the other jurors about the power spectrum. He got asked about the computational um, aspect of that equation. Then questions from the re reviewer like, or oh, if you decrease the ratio of this tube, or if you consider this fledged n, what will happen? Like, I didn't really get convinced by his answers. Thank you. So I think I also saw a 10. Anyone give a 10 on a comment? Okay. Uh, sure, I can. Okay, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say. Uh, I mean, I was just impressed given that like I've taken graduate level courses on fluid dynamics and you guys had concepts that were above and beyond that. So that was what impressed me the most. So, yeah. Thank you, and for the opponent, uh, I think the lowest mark was also around about five, six, range. no, no? Seven, uh, anyone gave a seven? No, no one wants to call. Uh, call uh, no, no. Oh. To the cards Several sevens, okay. Yeah. And for the reviewer, it was. Oh, ten. I a forgot. Lot a lot of tens, <laughs> but it was fairly consistent as well. I think. Okay. Okay. Cool. So then that will finally conclude the uh, third stage of the final. So we'll have a short break, and then we'll calculate the scores, and then we'll come back in maybe 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, don't stop the stream, by the way. So don't. Ah, don't stop the stream. Let the stream go. And then we'll have this device for only I guess or whoever is that's gonna send them over. Tony's gonna say everything. Oh, I right, good stuff. Thank you. I have to.
Test, 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 test. All right, could everybody uh, return to your seats? We'll get started. All right, welcome everyone to the closing ceremony and awards of CYPT 2020. I hope everybody had fun uh, and learned a thing or two. Uh, firstly, I would like to invite Kaylee Ting, our sponsorship and marketing director, to bring you a word from our sponsors. Thank you. Where this a little. Okay, so, oh, let me forward this first. Uh, so first we would like to say thank you to all of our generous sponsors, the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics, SciNet, Perimeter Institute, and of course the Physics Department at the University of Toronto. Uh, and now a special message from this year's gold sponsor, uh, the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics. The Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto is an endowed research institute with over 50 faculty, postdocs, student and staff dedicated to innovative technology, groundbreaking, groundbreaking research, world class training and public engagement. They have a number of opportunities for students, including a summer program called Introduction to Astronomical Instrumentation. Um, at this program, students have a chance to participate in lectures and hands-on lab activities led by astronomers from all around the world. Uh, second, they have a summer undergraduate research program. And finally, they have graduate programs and outreach events for students. Uh, we know many of you are in um, grades 11 and 12, and we're hoping that you'll continue to pursue your interests in physics in your undergraduate career. And if you do, uh, please check out their website to learn more about their programs. So once again, thank you so much to this year's gold sp sponsor, the Dunlap Institute. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, so now, Kaylee, can you come up here and uh, we'll be presenting the bronze, oh, we'll actually be presenting our participation uh, certificates. Uh, so unfortunately, these teams didn't make the finals, but I know you guys put in a lot of effort and uh, hard work. So could I get uh, Mark Garneau, uh, Limerence, and uh, St. Roberts down here? So let's just invite these three teams up uh, on stage. Well, on stage, uh, we our uh, certificates are not ready, but you can pick it up uh, at the end of the day, which is pretty much already at the end of the day. But yes, Ryan is preparing that like right now. So uh, we will just have everyone come up here. Our streaming camera is very high quality. Okay, so just uh, stay still for a moment, and then that will be our picture. Okay. Because uh, I, I guess the photographer is me, but I'm here, so that's why, I guess. All right, come on down, guys. Everyone. Don't be shy, guys. Come on. <laughs> Don't be shy, although you're a team leader, well, you might not have a, a teacher as your team leader, but that doesn't mean uh, you wouldn't come down. So let me just invite all of you guys down. Everyone on the team, take off your jacket. Come down for a photo. Everyone. Everyone, everyone, stay with your team. Come down, come down. Out. Okay, I think they're just slightly stuck in their chairs, but uh, yes, take your time, no worries, okay? Stand with your team, okay? And we, we will stand beside them, uh, 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 where the camera can see you, that is right in front of the screen, okay? So everyone, just st stand with your team, look at the camera, okay? And just stay still for a mo moment, three, two, one, stay still. That'll be our picture. Still frame extraction will work. Thank you guys. Uh, don't forget to pick up your certificates and now we will move on to uh, our uh, bronze medal teams. All right, so uh, if we call you up, uh, come up here and uh, shake Kaylee's hand and get your medals. So uh, for the bronze medal, we would like to congratulate uh, 
Team Mustang, first and foremost, but they unfortunately left. Uh, but we have UTS Pi with 46.7 points uh, in the finals. Congratulations, guys. Now uh, we'll have Jim present the silver medals. And so the team that won the silver medal is Pentacorx with 48.9 points. Congratulations. Now for the uh, long-awaited gold medal, we have Professor Bailey from the University of Toronto Department of Physics to present the gold medal to Team UTS Sigma with 54 points in the final round. Congratulations, guys. All right, congratulations guys, good work. And uh, since Professor Bailey is already up here, we'll do the uh, individual awards. He will be presenting the best experiment and best theory awards. So first, uh, we'll start off with the best experiment award and it recognizes the most creative and effective uh, experimental setup. Uh, and this award is based on your experimental score and your comments. So we would like to present the best experiment award to Xiong uh, Xiong Pei uh, from Team Pentacorx. Well done, well done. Good work, good work. Next, uh, we will be presenting the uh, CYPT Best Theory Award, and it recognizes the most in-depth and unifying theoretical analysis. And this award is based on your theory score, as well as your comments. And I'm proud to present the uh, Best Theory Award to Daniel Yang from Team UTS Sigma. Well done, well done. Good work. Well done, well done. All right, thank you so much, Professor Bailey. All right, so now we will present the uh, 
uh, Asadi Lari Leadership Award. Uh, this award was ma nominated by the CYPT committee uh, for recognizing superb leadership in their team. The recipient of this year's award is only in grade nine. Uh, he started his uh, team and this is the first ever team at his school. Uh, his team has no uh, teacher supervisor, no past CYPT members, and is overall the youngest team at this tournament. Uh, but nonetheless, he has excelled and done incredibly well. Uh, I would like to present the award to Hector Chen from Mark Darnot. Congratulations. The final award is a new award this year. Uh, it is the Teacher Advisor Award. Uh, this award recognizes a teacher's extraordinary dedication to their team's success. Uh, this teacher, this winner this year, has been part of uh, CYPT since its beginning. And over the past four years, uh, she has trained six teams uh, that have always consistently been at the top of the leaderboard and has been growing at an incredible rate. Uh, last year, three out of the five national team members were trained by her, which is absolutely incredible. And she is also a member of the CYPT 2020 Problem Select Committee. I'm proud to present the Teacher Advisor Award to Ms. Vanderkamp. All right, before we end, I would give a, I, I want to give a few thank yous uh, for all those that helped out this year with CYPT. Uh, firstly, I want to thank the jurors for lending their time and expertise. We could not have uh, run CYPT without you guys. I would also like to thank all the teacher advisors for helping your team compete uh, and, and uh, for all your patience and, and helping them excel in this tournament. I would also like to thank the team, the team leaders, uh, for your time, effort, and creativity. Uh, regardless if you won uh, something or not, I hope you learned and have fun. Uh, finally, I want to thank my fellow committee members for coordinating things and making this tournament possible. Uh, thank you, everyone. And before we conclude, um, if you have any comments or suggestions, uh, please feel free to leave it in our survey, which we will email to you guys. Uh, for team members and team leaders, uh, consider joining our member, sh uh, member school program. And if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, additionally, if you were part of the top five teams, uh, the individual selection information will be passed on to you guys soon, and we're currently working on the individual selection phase and the national camp. Uh, thank you guys for coming uh, to CYPT 2020, and we hope to see you in 2021. Thank you guys. Thank you.